from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. Just gone 10. Hello, good morning and welcome to the show. You are listening to and watching Swarbrick on Sunday live here on LBC. I'm Tom Swarbrick. Hope we find you very well this Sunday morning. Coming up, they're still at it in Brussels. Frost and Barnier trudge away with trade talks as the military war game medicines being blocked in the channel and the lorries stack up on the way into Dover. A no-deal Brexit hangs on the face of it, it would seem, on fish. But it does seem hard to believe that the government negotiating to avoid tariffs would be willing to see tariffs applied across the board in the event of no deal. Mind you, with this lot, it's hard to tell. Brexit tea leaves will be read later on in the show. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Good morning to you. After weeks of mounting scepticism about the wisdom of the government's Christmas freeing up, inevitably Boris Johnson, the head of a government so seemingly lacking in wisdom, severely curtailed Christmas for everyone. We can argue, if you like, about the measures themselves. Is a lockdown for the South East and London and parts of the East really necessary? Should schools have been closed a bit earlier? Is an enforced travel ban now needed? We can argue about implementation all you like, but where there is no argument is in the abject humiliation for the government around the process of getting to this decision. Governing well in, in the easiest of times is difficult, but there is, I think, no sensible person genuinely believing that they've got it easy at the moment. And, and frankly, many people are willing to cut them some slack. But Boris Johnson's government repeatedly took a shotgun to its own foot in ignoring the warnings about the wisdom of opening up for five days. A week ago, the government knew the new strain was more transmissible. For weeks, the government knew that cases were rising, and yet Boris Johnson's government persisted in telling people they could have a freed-up Christmas, but that farcically they should ignore his own government's advice about just how free to be. Untenable unnecessary, unwise. And so here we are today with your Christmas plans in bits and people scrabbling to get out of London before the restrictions came in at midnight last night. How has your Christmas now changed? Do you think a tougher lockdown is the right thing to do? And why do you think the Prime Minister persisted for so long with the five days of freedom plan? What is the impact on the government's authority this morning of having you turned again? 0345 6060 973. The Health Secretary joins us this morning. We'll speak to members of SAGE and of NERVTAG as well. That's the committee who first tracked this new variant of coronavirus. We start, though, this morning by turning to LBC's Westminster correspondent, Ben Kentish. Ben, good to have you on the programme again this morning. Uh, talk us through the latest decision making in government and about how we arrived at this new form of lockdown. It started at the start of the last week, Tom. That was when the government first really became aware of this new strain of COVID-19. And they say it drove this spike that we've seen in cases across London and across the southeast. On Friday night, Boris Johnson convened a meeting of his top ministers, his top scientists, and again on Saturday, and he spoke then to his cabinet. And it was at those three meetings that it was decided that ministers say because of this new strain of the virus, which accounts for 60% of the new cases in London in the last week, is somewhere between 60 and 70% more transmissible than the previous strain. Government ministers saw the way things were heading and they decided to act. But there are big questions here, Tom, of course, because what was not predictable was the new strain. What was very predictable was that the Christmas easing, regardless of the new strain, would still lead to a huge spike in cases. That had been clear from the sage scientists for the best part of six weeks. And still, for weeks, ministers said they were going to go ahead until the very last minute. Now, they say the decisive factor, as I say, was the new strain. But there are questions about whether they should have acted earlier once they saw the way that cases were heading and that's the criticism it's criticism that people like Labour leader Sakir Starmer are making. Mm. Uh, and, and on the um, when government knew what about the, the new strain, um, we heard Chris Whitty talk about the various points that they can now see where this virus was starting to spread about, this new strain of the virus was starting to spread about. He was talking about cases in early December and in November as well. 
Yeah, the, the, it sounds like the strain itself was identified uh, late in November. Tom, there was a cluster of cases in Medway and Kent that seemed to be spreading very fast. And when they assessed the genomics of that strain of the virus, uh, they discovered it was a new one. It was only, uh, the government says, uh, the end of the week, Friday effectively, when the uh, ministers were presented with data showing that that strain was indeed much more transmissible. It transmits much faster faster than the previous one. So even though it had been identified, this is my understanding of it uh, from government, even though it had been identified at the end of November, it wasn't really until this week that ministers were uh, given any sense of certainty from SAGE mm. that indeed it did uh, it did, tra it did transmit much faster. Even though it was at the start of the week, Tom, it is worth saying, Matt Hancock did tell the Commons that he thought that strain might be responsible for the large rise in cases across the southeast. It was only confirmed on Friday, and that's what the government is using to explain why this decision was made so late. And of course, the group of scientists that were monitoring this spread, the group Nerve Tag, will be speaking to them a little bit later on. Ben, thank you. Ben Kentish, LBC's Westminster correspondent, 10 past 10. Joining me is Colonel Bob Stewart, Conservative MP for Beckenham. Welcome to the programme this morning, uh, Colonel Bob. Um, your thoughts on how this all this all has been handled so far? With huge difficulty, Tom, to be honest, um, Boris Johnson is, you know, between a rock and a hard place. He wants to try and keep the economy going. Think of the retailers. Think of the London retailers. This is going to be their maximum time, their best time of the year. And he wants to try and keep the economy going. But at the same time, he's got to keep the country as safe as possible. And he is the one that makes the decision. Everyone else, you know, can can make their own comments, but he has responsibility for the care of the country. And um, so he is literally between a rock and a hard place. And um, yeah, the decision might have been made a little bit earlier, but because of the reason of trying to keep Christmas open, I suspect that's why the decision was late. Um, Boris Johnson, as Prime Minister, is doing his very best for everyone. I know people will say, some people will say, no, no, disagree. They might anyway. But the fact of the matter is, do you think the Prime Minister wants this to happen? No, he doesn't. I've spoken to him about it. And his, his view was fundamentally, the last thing I want to do is to lock down the country. But uh, everyone's telling me I've got to. And if I don't, and it goes terribly wrong, the butt stops here. And that's the problem uh, for the Prime Minister. It's an impossible situation at the moment. Yeah. I mean, my Christmas, our Christmas, our family Christmas personally has been ruined because, you know, we can't get our, our daughters back. Um, but I'm just thinking much more important than that is that the whole of the country, um, all those people in the southeast of England have had their Christmas considerably ruined and at the last minute. I wish it hadn't been the last minute, but that's what we've got. So you think people will be largely sympathetic to having their Christmases uh, canned at the last minute because of the difficulties <laughs> that the Prime Minister faces? No, of course they won't. Um, they, 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 they loathe this, but um, they will understand that you know the decision has had to be made. They will say, they will why loathe. I, you're you're like... Colonel Bob, you're you're absolutely right. They will people will loathe yeah, being they told said they, they can't have Christmas earlier, as normal. That's... Well, quite, but people will also loathe, won't they? The the method of getting to this point. I mean, it's been the government have been told were told time and time and time again that it might not be advisable to allow people five days of freedom to drop the tier system for five mm -hmm. days over Christmas, and yet they persisted and persisted and persisted. I totally understand. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting you intermittently, um, probably my end, but uh, yes, that's true. Um, but as I say, the Prime Minister was trying his very best to try and keep the, the economy open. Mm. I, I wonder just very finally if the line holds out, what you made of the Prime Minister's demeanour at the press conference yesterday. I don't know about you, but I noticed um, he was more, than down, more downcast than normal. Well, <laughs> what the country and the, is feeling the whole country yeah. is downcast and and but he's had to make the decision it's him that has to make the decision on this and he didn't want to make that decision but he's had to
Colonel Bob Stewart, we persisted with the line. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Conservative MP for Beckenham. Let's come straight to your calls on this this morning. Maxine's in Hackney. Hi there, Maxine. Hello. Um, I just wanted to say I'm not um, changing my plans. I actually chuckled when I saw the Prime Minister say, you know, oh, we, Christmas is cancelled. Because, you know, and then I've heard a lot of, um, you know, journalists say, oh, people like me are selfish and this and that. It's like I said to my husband, you all weren't... Uh, saying how selfish Black Lives Matter were when you were all fawning all over them and um, when they were seven well, sorry hang on Maxine before, before you before you start with yeah. the vituperative stuff do you, what are your Christmas plans well I'm going to see my son and his girlfriend are going to have uh, and they're it, under the new restrictions they wouldn't be allowed now I don't care <laughs> I don't I, I just don't care I'm, I'm like I said I don't care what that I, you, I don't ask government for permission to see my own stuff. Not doing it. And like I say, when the journalists say how selfish everyone is, when they were fawning over Black Lives Matter, 7,000 strong, no one was asking them what, how selfish they were, pulling down statues. I think some people were, London. to be fair. I think, no, I, I no, think some people were worried were, about no, the congregation. No, no, they of, were talking about of thousands of people. Listen, it's more of yep. an issue than COVID. They were fawning over them, having them on the show, you know, letting them talk. So, about Maxine, their calls. Instead, of, it, you, it, instead of joining in with the criticism of people that you disagree with, you're going to join in with their actions essentially yeah anyone it's already broken now so why 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 should i be the one when you've got like loads of mps breaking it you know the leader of Sinn Féin going to a funeral with a thousand people you've got rosie duffield jeremy corbyn's broken it uh angela rayner's broken it why am i going along with it? even the scientist who set this up in the start he wasn't even following it. He was carrying on with some fancy women. Well, the thing is, the thing is, Maxine, that if they don't take it seriously, then why should I? Why should well, I listen, sacrifice Maxine, my Ma- son? No, I understand that. People will be in a, a similar position, I think, in being very, very upset at the idea of having to cancel their Christmas. And to be honest with you, there is nothing, really, that the government can do about it. If you're going to decide to break what are now the restrictions, then then you're going to break them. I'm afraid uh, all of us may well bear the, some of the consequences for that. Have yourself a safe Christmas. 0345 973 Nerve Tag, join us. That is the group responsible for monitoring uh, new and emerging respiratory viruses. They are the group that was looking at this new strain that came in. We'll be joined by one of them members in just a few moments. Swarbrick on Sunday here on LBC 1016. This is LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster on LBC. Morning to you, 20 past 10 is the time. Tom Swarbrick with you here this Sunday morning on LBC. Feels a bit like the morning after the night before, doesn't it, given everything that happened yesterday. Um, We'll speak to the Health Secretary in about 10 minutes' time. Matt Hancock is going to be on the programme to answer some questions that I think we've all got uh, regarding what on earth went on over the last five days that have seen us end up in this position. Mind you, as Gary points out, it's not just Boris Johnson uh, who's getting a kicking for how we got here. Tom, why is everybody giving Boris a kicking and let all the devolved governments off the hook? They all agreed the same relaxation for Christmas and now they have all U-turned at the same time. It's not a not an unfair point that Gary makes. Come to more of your calls in a few moments. We'll also be joined by Nerve Tag in a sec, but I want to turn to this morning's front pages, which, as you can expect, uh, picks up on where we left off yesterday afternoon. lbc.co.uk, lbc.co.uk. Christmas in chaos for millions after Tier 4 lockdown. You can also look at the uh, images that were rolling around social media last night of the thousands of people who were leaving London on those packed trains yesterday evening before the restrictions came in mail on sunday this morning will this nightmare ever end they ask Uh, uh, hopefully there's an answer to that hopefully it's not just rhetorical uh the daily star uh turkey clown pm bozo stuffs christmas u-turn puts millions in lockdown three uh sunday express fast spreading covid19 wrecks christmas five-day festivities cancelled as terrifying terrifying new virus strain spreads uh sunday mirror boris u turns yet again lost christmas 17.7 million they say plunge into festivity busting tier four covid super strain threatens to sweep the country daily telegraph sunday telegraph rather christmas cancelled for millions families plans thrown into chaos as swathes of the country are locked down Sunday Times this morning, Christmas is cancelled by surging mutant virus with a picture of Boris Johnson underneath. Some people have pointed out that seems a little unfair on the Prime Minister to refer him, to him as a surging mutant virus. Um, and interestingly in there, their leader column is, is uh, doesn't mince its words about uh, the position, how we've ended up in this position today. Uh, Sunday people finally, mutant virus kills Christmas. And then of course the Observer, 
Uh, Johnson U-turn leaves nation's plans for Christmas in tatters. Spread of new COVID strain forces lockdown. Stay home is the alert for London and the southeast. Uh, let's speak to Dr. Ben Killingley, who is a member of NerveTag, a consultant in acute medicine and infectious diseases from University College London Hospitals, who is speaking to us this morning in a personal capacity. Dr. Killingley, thank you very much for coming on the programme this morning. Um, tell us when NerveTag first got wind, if you can, of this of this new strain of the virus. Uh, NerveTag uh, had an extraordinary meeting on Friday uh, to discuss uh, uh, the new strain of virus. Uh, you'll know that uh, the virus mutates all the time. So this is one of many mutations. So it's uh, nicer to call it a strain. Um, obviously, you'll hear that uh, it was numbers of cases in Kent and Southeast have been on the rise uh, despite the tier three lockdown for some time. And data had come in, large data about epidemiolo epidemiology, looking at the, the rate of rise of infections. And that's when NerveTag get a meeting to say that this looked like it was a much more transmissible infection than we had mm. been seeing before. And that was on Friday. Um, what then was it that prompted others, in, in particular the health secretary, to say on Monday that they believed that this new strain was responsible for uh, much more of the transmissions that were taking place in the south and the southeast? So uh, the new, new strains are arising all the time. Uh, this is what's notable about this strain is that in the summer we had a strain that uh, a new strain that came and it didn't take over. And it didn't take over at a time when the number of infection rates were quite low. Um, infection rates across the country are relatively high at the moment. And that it was still possible for this new virus to take a foot in lots of competition from lots of other virus around. So I think it's that fact that's quite important that tells us that this virus has an advantage in terms mm. of transmission. Um, and we've seen that nationally in, the, say, the rise of spread. So that's where the big data has led us yes. uh, to the, this just, conclusion. Sorry to come back to this, this point about timings. Um, the, the health secretary said on Monday that they're aware of a new strain of the virus that could be responsible for uh, the greater transmission that's being seen across the south and southeast, particularly in Kent. Who briefed the health secretary about that, if not NerveTag? Um, I, I, I can't answer that question. Um, the, okay. We were brought. The, the data came to us on Friday in the meeting for for Nerve Tag to to make some judgment, give some give some judgment on the science presented to it from the modellers and from the epidemiological data. Uh, and simply the question being asked: Is this virus more transmissible? Is the evidence there that it is? And our answer was that yes, there does seem to be. There's moderate degree of con of confidence to be able to say that, yes, this is significantly more transmissible. And, not, and, and, that, and that scientific evidence is what then obviously ministers take yeah. forward to make decisions from there. And can you explain, what does 70% more transmissible actually mean? Um, it's the, it gives an indicator, trying to put that in the R number, you'll have heard the R number before. We think it uh, cr creates about a 0.4 on top of the R number. And if you've got an R number, we want to keep the R number around one. Below one means infections are reducing. So if you've got an R number of about 0.9 and you're thinking, OK, well, if things are slowly reducing, if you put a 0.4 on top of that 1.3, then that's relatively significant mm. and that's growing much faster. So that's where the, the science to say, yes, it looks like it's growing faster and the prospect of Christmas with lots of people meeting and travelling, it's those two things that have really caused the concern uh, and led to the, 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 the dumbing down of Christmas, really, rather than, yeah. than say, the cancelling of Christmas, but you know what I mean. Uh, uh, and we've, we've been told that the good news, if there is some, and we're clinging on to every bit we can get right now, is that the, this new strain is much less likely to see uh, more people die. Um, but is there any evidence to suggest that, to suggest that you are as likely to be hospitalised if you were to catch this as the original? Um, I think we're still working on those sorts of figures. The data we've had so far is quite big data looking across the country, uh, particularly looking at the southeast. Uh, there are lots of work now going on to look at individual cases. We haven't seen an increase in death rates of hospitalised patients with the new strain. Obviously, right. as cases go up generally, there'll still be hospitalizations and there may be rises in death 
as a proportion of the hospitalizations. But we haven't seen the evidence to say that this new strain is causing a higher fatality rate yet. Is there any evidence that the new variant affects the accuracy of the PCR tests, the swabs that go, go up your nose and down your mouth? Uh, no. No. OK, so the, the that, PCR well, that's tests, good it, it's not a, It's not a big... So it's important. It's not a big enough uh, change in the virus that either the tests won't work or importantly, that we don't, we still think the vaccines developed to date mm. will still work because the virus has changed a bit, but not enough. That was going to be my next question. I'm glad you anticipated that. We still anticipate <laughs> that the vaccine will work. I mean, again, we're clinging on to good news here, uh, Doctor, yeah. um, that the vaccine will work against this new strain. Uh, that's what we believe so far. Um, I say, because we don't believe that the, the strain has changed enough that it will escape the the immunity that the vaccine provides. Clearly, we need to be looking at this robustly. We've always yeah. said that three, the three vaccines out there, that we will always need more for different reasons. But we're confident at the moment, more work needs to be done. But the early signs are that the vaccine will still be effective. So that shouldn't be a, a reason for people to think they won't, shouldn't get the virus. Uh, the vaccine, I've got no, sorry. yeah. I, I've got no context around this, not being scientific in any way, shape, or form. But seventy percent transmissibility south sounds and feels like a lot. Um, what then are chances of controlling this thing? Because it, it it seems as if with the chances of transmissibility transmissibility being that high, this thing could run out of control very quickly. Yeah. So the estimate is between forty and seventy percent increased transmissibility. So people have picked the pick the higher but pick the higher level. Ah. Um, we need we need to be, uh, and that's just based. I say that's based on that's based on the on, on fairly large data. Uh, it will transmit in the same way. There isn't anything different we need to do to avoid transmission. It's still about reducing our contacts. It's still about washing hands. It's still about wearing face masks when you're out or about. The actual the key things that we need to do don't change, but we just need to do them better and be more cognizant of them. But the actual social distancing rules and the things we should be doing will stay the same. This is a virus that transmits through close contact. Sure. But is it, your view, is it your view that the tier four restrictions that many millions of people are now living under will have to remain in place until either the strain mutates again to become less transmissible or the vaccine is out? Um, I, sim I simply don't know that. I know that the government are reviewing the numbers of cases uh, on a two-week, well, they're reviewing them all the time, but they will review the tier four, three restrictions on a two-weekly basis based on the data. If we see the R numbers coming down below one, and that means things are quietening down, then you might imagine that restrictions could be lifted. But I think we're in the early days of this at the moment. Um, and as lots of people have said, including the chief medical officer yesterday, until we get to a stage where lots of more people have had the vaccine, this could be a, uh, an unpleasant few months with restrictions continuing. And it's not just this country. You'll be aware that all over Europe things are happening as well. Yes. And just very finally on this, um, obviously for the restrictions in Tier 4 mean that you can't do... International travel is not going to be allowed for people in Tier 4. Uh, I, uh, very boringly, I went through some of the minutes of, of nerve tag meetings from the past, and in January the suggestion was that there was no need to have airport screenings done in this country, that it wasn't going to be particularly effective. Do you think that advice should change now based on the transmissibility of this new strain? Um, so the problem with airport screening is it's not a very good way to detect people who've got the virus coming in. Uh, there are lots of people at various stages in their infection and airport screening only picks up the few people who've got fever. That's all it does. But it the, misses all the that, asymptomatic. Sorry, but that goes against the minutes of your own meeting, which said in January that four out of the five cases that had been found outside of China had been detected at an airport. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I don't, I don't recall that. I don't recall that sort of four out of five figure. Um, airport screening well, in general is <laughs> airport screening is general is not a very sensitive tool to pick up cases. Um, people obviously are when they arrive back in the country. If they have symptoms, they need to self isolate at home and stick to the stick to the sort of social distancing and the quarantine rules when they arrive back. Mm. And people arriving into a quarantine uh, tier four area. Uh, obviously have to follow the same quarantine measures sure. that everyone else does. But I don't think airport screening is going to be useful.
Good to speak to you. Have yourself a safe Christmas. Dr. Ben Killingley, who is a member of NerveTag, consultant in acute medicine and infectious diseases from University College London Hospitals. Thank you for your time this morning. 03456060973 is my number. In a few moments, the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, live on the programme. 10.32, Tom Swarbrick on LBC. News headlines now. Here's Bill Overton. It suggested restrictions which have thrown the Christmas plans for millions of people into chaos may have to stay in place until vaccines are rolled out. London and the southeast of England are now under stricter rules because of the spread of a new strain of coronavirus. The government's called those who rushed to leave Tier 4 areas last night before the rules came in totally irresponsible. Trains were packed and roads busy with last-minute journeys. Labour's complained about the late timing of the announcement. One Conservative MP with a Tier 4 constituency has told this programme... Boris Johnson's in an impossible situation. Wales has had to bring forward its third national lockdown a week to today, while Scotland is banning people from travelling to and from the country from anywhere else in Britain. The weather, sunny spells and blustery scattered showers across the UK today. Heavier rain for Wales and the west, a high of 10 degrees. LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Text 84850. 10.36 10.36 is the time. Come back to your calls in just a moment. I'm joined live by the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Conservative MP for West Suffolk. Thank you very much for being on the line for us this morning, Mr Hancock. Uh, good to speak to you. Um, let's clear this up. When exactly did the government know that this new strain of the virus was more transmissible than the old one? We were briefed on this new scientific fact at three o'clock on, on Friday. And so we then took the very swift decisive action to, that the Prime Minister announced it, uh, on on Saturday afternoon. So, you know, it was it, it was not a good fact to be told um, mm. and obviously very uh, significant. And so we moved uh, very fast at that point, even though, you know, such a difficult decision and the impact on people, I mean, on, all, on all of us. I had to phone my own mum last night and said I wouldn't be seeing her at Christmas and, and you know, I was just one of millions of people having to do yeah. that. No, understood. It's, it's going to impact a lot of people. So so Friday was the day, the moment that you were told as the Secretary of State for Health that this thing was much more transmissible. Yes, that, and up to 70% more. And, you know, the consequence of that is that we just have to all be so much yes. more cautious in terms of well, seeing any other human. Can, yeah. can I play you this? This is from your statement to the Commons on Monday, if you wouldn't mind taking a listen. The last few days, thanks to our world-class genomic capability in the UK, we have identified a new variant of coronavirus, which may be associated with the faster spread in the southeast of England. Initial analysis suggests that this variant is growing faster than the existing variants. We've currently identified over a 1,000 cases with this variant, predominantly in the south of England, although cases have been identified in nearly 60 different local authority areas, and numbers are increasing rapidly. How was you addressing the House of Commons on Monday? What changed then between the initial analysis that led you to say that the variant is growing faster than the existing variants um, to the info that you got on Friday? Yeah, so the, the, the distinction is one of correlation and causality. So I was first told that, that the new variant uh, existed the Friday before, so 10 days ago now, nine days ago. Uh, and that statement to the House on Monday uh, was explaining that we have a new variant. It was growing, it is growing faster, but we didn't know whether it was growing because it was present in parts of the country where things were growing faster, and it just happened to be that it was because it was in those parts of the country, or whether there was a cause and effect from the new variant leading to and mm-hmm. being the cause of the faster growth. And so last week we knew, last Friday we were told that this new variant existed, and uh, this Friday we were told that it was causing this faster spread. And, the, and in, so that, the, in that gap, the distinction, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. The, the, you've explained the distinction. In that gap, the position of the government was to tell people that they could have five days over Christmas where they could um, trap where the tears would be dropped. In the week that you found yourself in an extraordinary position where the government was announcing a policy that it was telling people to ignore, this has been handled shambolically. Uh, no, that's wrong. So um, what I announced in that statement that you just played the clip from was a very significant tightening of the rules and the restrictions in 
uh, London and parts of Essex and Hertfordshire. I realised that, but for five days over Christmas, this is the 23rd to the 28th, I realised that the the rules changed um, for for people now, but you were planning to drop those rules for five days over Christmas. Uh, no, the the but we did uh, put in place the new restrictions in in London and the southeast, um, and we were clear about people's personal responsibility because it's not just about the government rules; it's also about people's personal responsibility. And then, when we found the when we were told the new scientific evidence, we took further action both on Christmas uh, and on bringing in the new tier four. And the thing is, Tom, that, you know, it's not about doing the easy thing, even if something is difficult, and even if you're going to get criticised for it, you've got to do the right thing. And But you so must have been making fa- representations, you must have been re- making representations to, to the, the COVID group that meets to say, well, we've got this word about this new uh, strain of the virus. Let's, let's take a decision on Christmas now, sooner rather than later. Were you persuading your colleagues to do that? Well, we all work together and make these decisions collectively. And you do, but you also have you uh, you have different opinions going into making those decisions collectively. Was your opinion when you first heard about this new strain of of the virus was was your opinion that we needed to lock down a bit harder earlier? Well, my opinion was that we needed to come to a government decision and then announce it. And uh, I, I, I'm just not going to get into the the internal decision making because what matters is that everybody can represent you know, can explain and discuss their views. These are really big calls. And then we come to a collective judgment on it. Yeah. And uh, and you, you know how government operates. You've seen it from the inside, Tom. And you know that what everybody does is they make their, view, make their views clear in private. They do. And then we come to the uh, best collective judgment that we can. They do. I, I've not seen a government announce a policy that it's told people to ignore before. But let me come on to something that you, you, you've said earlier, that you think that this, this is going to be very difficult to keep this under control until a vaccine rolls out. Yeah. Um, you've talked about doing the difficult thing. Let's be really straight with people that Tier 4 is probably here to stay, isn't it, until the vaccine becomes much, much more widely available? Well, we're still uh, learning about the new variant uh, as you know has been demonstrated over the last few days so we we don't know uh, the answer to that question what we do know is that right now everybody can make a difference to the spread of this virus by by essentially keeping away from close contact with other people uh, and it's how long forward do you think roughly is there is there any time frame we, i mean i know the reviews are relatively regular, yeah the, the do, legal reviews every two weeks but i yeah. think we do need to be um, absolutely straightforward that that the actions needed to control this new variant are really serious because we know that the november lockdown uh, did not work against this new variant because the cases carried on rising in Kent. That's how we spotted that there was a new variant that was having this impact in the first place because we were puzzled by why is it going up in Kent when it's coming down quite sharply everywhere else in the country. And so do you think we, that, should, we should read into the extension of the furlough until April as a possible sort of milestone for how long the much tighter restrictions to control this variant are going to be here for? Well, I hope that we have enough of the vaccine rolled out before then, but that depends on the sign-off by the MHRA of the Oxford-AstraZeneca uh, vaccine and the NHS ability it's, it's, to deploy it. Yeah, yeah we well, are in a race now. To, we, 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 we've got to vaccinate as quickly as we feasibly can, but we had to do that anyway, right? Because each vaccine say, starts to save lives as soon as you get the uh, to a week past that second dose. So four weeks after somebody's first been vaccinated, given that the second dose goes in after three weeks, and then there's about a week until full immunity comes through, you know, we're in a race to save lives anyway with the vaccine. I'm really glad that the vaccine rollout is accelerating. Um, The numbers are going up all the time. Um, The NHS has uh, confirmed that we'll be vaccinating through Christmas, Christmas Day, um, you know, when do you hope for a tipping point on that, on, on the number of people who have been vaccinated, to, to mean well, that more than half uh, have? Yeah, it's very, very tempting to answer that question, but it's not possible uh, for two okay. reasons. The first is we don't know the delivery schedule of the vaccine, not least because we haven't yet got MHRA sign-off on the Oxford vaccine. And secondly, because we don't know the impact of the vaccine on lowering the transmission of the disease. Yeah. So, so unfortunately, no answer to that question.
Um, let me ask you then finally about the people that we saw last night exiting London, getting on the trains. Yeah. Um, your 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 message to those people who were in the, in that train station or in those stations trying to get out of London. I thought it was totally irresponsible, the scenes that we saw in St Pancras last night. Thankfully, it was only a small, relatively small number of people. Uh, but the rules are in place for a reason. You know, we don't bring these things in lightly. They're in place to but was save it irrespons- lives. Sorry, but was it irresponsible because it's irresponsible to travel across the country with a new strain of the virus knocking around? Or, or is it yeah. irresponsible because the rules have now changed? No, it's irresponsible because we had made clear to the public that there's a new highly transmissible strain of the virus that at the moment so why, is very why, largely So why, Secretary of State, were five days of tear-dropping Christmas days going to be allowed until yesterday? If it was irresponsible to travel around the country with a new strain of the virus, that, that was the case re- with the Christmas rules regardless of, regardless of the Christmas rules or not? No, as you, as you know, as we discussed at the, earlier, uh, that, that uh, uh, the, the new information, the new scientific advice came through on, on Friday afternoon, and that's what, that's what changed the decision. But then it's, once the Prime Minister had stood up and said, we have a highly transmissible new strain, uh, it is largely concentrated in the southeast of England, uh, and people shouldn't travel. And the chief medical officer had said, specifically have asked if you've got your bag packs the bags are packed, what should you do? And he said you should unpack them and stay at home. To then see people uh, travelling, to in order to do that just before the, the law, we'd managed to get the legal change through, which we got it through in the early hours of this morning. I think that was irresponsible, yes. Um, Christmas is going to be very different, it sounds like, for the Hancock family as well as for, for many yeah. millions of others. You've, you've had, um, personally, uh, Mr Hancock, you've had just the most uh, horrendous year. Um, so we wish you a, a merry and safe Christmas for you and your family. Um, what, is, what is the Christmas tune of choice that's going to be on display in the Hancock house, do you think, oh. if you get a moment to, <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> to, put, some, to put something on? Oh, um, uh, uh, maybe, um, maybe something that has a cheerful ending. <laughs> well, well, uh, well. You have to report back to us about what it was that eventually allowed you to smile for a bit over the course of the Christmas holidays. Thank you very much indeed for your time, Secretary of State for Health Matt Hancock, uh, joining the program this morning. Conservative MP for West Suffolk. Um, I think everyone deserves a bit of a break from this, don't they? Even if they've been making the decisions at the top end of this, even if we've had back and forth about whether the right decisions have been made. Uh, as as you can tell, I, I don't understand how the government got itself into a position where it was advising people to to um, t- take personal responsibility against the policy that they were putting forward. But then the position changed, of course, pretty dramatically yesterday when Boris Johnson plunged us, some of us anyway, millions more of us, into Tier 4. Come to more of your calls in just a few moments. We'll hear from Labour before Sir Keir Starmer gets to his feet. The Labour leader due to give a press conference in about 12 minutes' time. We'll take it live. You'll hear it here on LBC. Tom Swarbrick here, 1048. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. LBC. Nick Gibb, who's schools minister and of course a Conservative MP, talking about children. Some of them are going to be in receipt of meals courtesy of UNICEF. For Jacob Rees-Mogg, it's a political stunt. Is it, Minister? What UNICEF decides to spend the money that it's received from people who donate to it is a matter for them. Is it a political stunt? It's a sort of yes or no, I sense here, Minister. I think many of the thousands of people who donate money to UNICEF, I think they might be surprised that it's been spent in this country, particularly as we have a government that is committed to ensuring that no child from the poorest families will be hungry. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. LBC. This is LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick. Live from Westminster. We'll speak to Thangam Demelair from Labour's Shadow Cabinet in just a few moments. Sir Keir Starmer speaking in a bit. Here's Ben on 84850. Tom, he, probably the Prime Minister, just criminalised a massive number of the population who will undoubtedly ignore this. Didn't we just have a damn lockdown to allow Christmas? The country won't forget or forgive this. A lockdown which the Health Secretary just told us in November didn't work. Here's Wendy in Portsmouth this morning. Hi, Wendy. Hi, how are you? I'm very well. Your thoughts? Okay, I don't think the government has given the country enough information, which is possibly why a lot of people will be thinking, well, why not visit someone if we just live down the road? And I think the information that we haven't got is what um, this 70% more transmissibility actually means. You actually asked the nerve tag sage professor what it meant, and his answer to you was that the R rate will increase. Well, that's an effect. But does it mean, this 70%, that there's more virus in the air 
does it mean it sticks onto services more or for longer? And he said, the, the stage person said, just do the same but better. But I think if we knew that there's perhaps more circulating in the air or on services, um, then perhaps people would then take heed of what the government is now saying. I just don't think that they're telling us everything that we need to know, Tom. Well, Wendy, listen, we're going to speak to um, a member of SAGE a bit later. And I, I, like you, I, I'm still waiting for um, a decent answer on the question, what does 70% transmissibility actually mean for, you know, it's all well and good to talk about our numbers, but for how we live our lives, that's clearly a very big issue. Wendy, good point. Thank you. I want to speak to Thangham Debonair, now Shadow Housing Secretary, Labour MP for Bristol West. Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, your thoughts on how we've ended up in this position? Well, I mean, is the first thing I want to say is that my heart just goes out to families who had plans, who this morning are waking up to those plans being completely ripped apart. Uh, there will be people who this week had looked forward after months and months of isolation and being separated from loved ones, who'd looked forward to spending the day together on, on Friday uh, and maybe even a few days and are now finding that that's going to work out as virtually impossible. And I, I really feel for people. And I think that whilst coronavirus as a, as a virus was not predicted, throughout the course of this year we've seen other events that could have made things better quicker sooner more efficiently that were both predicted and predictable and one of those for instance was the fact that there were infections increasing uh, in the weeks following the end of the lock second lockdown the government said the prime minister even said yesterday that he, they'd noticed that there was something worrying going on in kent and the surrounding count surrounding areas those were things which were known about so was the beginning of school turn so was university students coming back to university so was the fact that winter always brings an increase in respiratory illnesses predicted and predictable and the government failed to plan so why is it then that Sir Keir Starmer didn't call for the Christmas restrictions to be cancelled well, Keir Starmer called last week for the government to look again at the Christmas restrictions. He did so in Prime Minister's questions. And the Prime Minister, and this was, remember, that was only four days ago, the Prime Minister frankly did, ridiculed Keir's suggestion. He, he's, he's, he's asked, he asked the government to convene a COBRA in the next 24 hours, this is a letter yep. on the 15th, to review whether the current relaxation is appropriate given the rising number of cases. Why didn't he just say, if it was so blinking obvious, why didn't Sir Keir Starmer just say, listen, cancel Christmas? Because he doesn't have access to the same information that the health secretary and the prime minister have. He doesn't sit on COBRA, the prime minister does. The but scientific you've laid advice out that you've, government... just, you've just laid out for us, and indeed Matt Hancock was in the House of Commons, as I asked him about, on Monday saying there's a new variant of the virus. So we all had similar information, R rates, case numbers, yep. hospitalizations, new variant of the virus. Why, why, why didn't Keir Starmer just say, OK, enough, uh, up with this we should not put, let's call on Christmas to be cancelled? Because he asked for the government to do the responsible thing and take the scientific advice seriously. And that was the right thing to do, to call a COBRA to look at the scientific advice immediately. That was absolutely the right thing to do. The Health Service Journal, even on Tuesday, had said there was going to be a crisis and a massive spike in infections and possible crisis in the NHS. All of those things need to be put together. And that's what Keir Starmer asked the Prime Minister to do, to take the responsible step of reviewing it and coming to an urgent conclusion. Now, he hasn't acted responsibly. He's failed time and time again, despite Labour warning on things like test, track and trace and previously on PPE, on schools returning. Every time there's been chaos that was both predictable and predicted. Every time the government has either poo-pooed or ignored warnings from the Labour Party and from others. And every time we find ourselves back in this position. And that's the Prime Minister's responsibility. I, I may have to I may have to cut you off, um, Fangham. So apologies in advance if I have it's to okay. do for for your boss because uh, Sakir is going to be um, uh, Sakir Starmer is going to be giving a press conference in I just know. a moment. Um, yep. But um, how how long then do you think these restrictions, certainly Tier Four, should stay in place for? Well. You know, as I said, I'm not the one that's... I don't have access to the same level of scientific advice as the health secretary does. But I think they need to be in place, and it is tragic that they have to be in place. And so we've got... We need a decent exit plan from the government. We need a proper plan for test, track and trace. We need urgently, and I say this with great feeling, a plan for how to support schools as they return after Christmas. All of these things are things that we know are going to happen. Well, quite. And, and the mass testing that is due to take place in schools is being looked at rather uh, worriedly by headmasters Poorly. and headmistresses about, yes. how they're, about how they're going to do it. I despair, frankly. I mean, I spoke to heads yesterday who are in absolute despair. Mm. Um,
So I, I think I think you're about to move me on to Keir Starmer. Well, no, no, I, 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 you can hear the music. Thank you, Debonair. Listen, thank you so much for joining the programme. Apologies, it was so short and sweet, but thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Debonair, Shadow Housing Secretary, Labour MP for Bristol West. Uh, she's got to make way for her boss. So Keir Starmer, due to speak uh, in a press conference in just a few moments' time, you will hear it here live on LBC, after which we will speak to Sage, uh, get their opinion, or scientist on Sage opinion, about what this new virus means, what indeed 70% transmission, uh, extra transmission, looks like um, uh, in going about our daily lives. Your calls as well. Many of you want to get on the radio this morning. How is your Christmas affected? Has it just been totally kiboshed? On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 11 o'clock, it's feared COVID restrictions, which have thrown Christmas plans up in the air for millions of people, may have to stay in place until vaccines are rolled out. A new tighter Tier 4 levels come in for London and the South East, parts of eastern England and Wales, due to rising infections fueled by a new strain of coronavirus, which spreads quicker. It effectively reasserts the November lockdown. That's no mixing between households and non-essential retail closes. Dr Ben Killingley is a consultant in infectious diseases and a member of the Nerve Tag Committee, which advises the Chief Medical Officer. He's told this programme he sees no reason for panic. There's not a big enough uh, change in the virus that either the tests won't work or, importantly, that we don't. We still think the vaccines developed to date mm. will still work because the virus has changed a bit, but not enough. We've just heard from the health secretary saying he's had to phone his own mother to tell her he won't be home next week. The five-day festive break for other areas is now reduced to just December the 25th. Wales has brought forward its third lockdown to today, while Scotland's banning people from travelling to and from the country from anywhere else in Britain. Labour's backing the tougher level of restrictions, but claims Boris Johnson's been far too slow to act. The Shadow Foreign Secretary Lisa Nandy says her party has been raising concerns over the new strain of the virus all week. Every day that concern has been dismissed, um, ridiculed by the Prime Minister in the House of Commons on Wednesday, only to find yesterday that people have made plans over the last week that now lie in tatters. Colonel Bob Stewart's the Conservative MP for Beckenham in Kent, which is in the new Tier 4. He's told Swarbrick on Sunday the Prime Minister is in an impossible situation. He is literally between a rock and a hard place. Do you think the Prime Minister wants this to happen? I've spoken to him about it. His view was fundamentally, the last thing I want to do is to lock down the country. Everyone's telling me I've got to, and if I don't, and it goes terribly wrong, the butt stops here. The head of the Police Federation, Ken Marsh, is worried about public confusion or a refusal to comply with the new rules. He says chopping and changing is making things very difficult for officers. When legislation is brought in, normally my colleagues have a lot of time to, to understand it, to learn it, etc, etc. This is being changed now on a daily basis and we're expected to get it right every time. A government source has said the UK will leave the EU without a trade deal if the European Union doesn't substantially alter its position. Another day of negotiations ended yesterday with no news of an agreement, despite there being less than two weeks now before the end of the transition period. LBC Weather. With Halls. Get winter ready. Sunny spells and blustery showers across the UK. Heavier rain for Wales in the west with a chance of hail and thunder. Drier further east and a high of 10 degrees. From Global's newsroom, I'm Bill Overton. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Very good morning to you. Three minutes past 11 is the time you're listening to Swarbrick on Sunday here on LBC. I'm Tom Swarbrick. Hope we find you very well this Sunday morning. Another, I'm afraid, very difficult Sunday morning, uh, for, particularly for the millions of us who in the south, in London, in the south east and in Kent have been put into tier four restrictions, meaning that basically Christmas is cancelled unless you've got a support bubble uh, that you can uh, have Christmas alongside. And for, of course, for everybody else, if you're outside of this tier four restriction, uh, you will no longer be given the five days of Christmas freedom that you were promised by the Prime Minister, a Prime Minister who said it would be inhuman to knock on the head that five days of Christmas freedom. Instead, you've only got one day on Christmas Day uh, where you can bubble up. Uh, we'll hear from Sir Keir Starmer in just a few moments. The Labour leader is due to give a press conference, uh, bearing in mind that he did push the Prime Minister on these Christmas freedoms in PMQs uh, on Wednesday. 
Uh, Labour had been making calls for the Prime Minister to review those Christmas restrictions again, and we all know that yesterday afternoon the Prime Minister did, based on the advice of his scientists, who said that there was a new highly transmissible strain that was rolling around the country, 70% more transmissible. What that actually means... We'll hear from Sage in just a few moments. One of their members will join us to explain what we can do to avoid catching this new strain. LBC's political editor, Theo Washua, joins us live this morning. Hi there, Theo. Very good morning to you, Tom. It's worth, of course, noting that on Tuesday, uh, Keir Starmer wrote to the Prime Minister urging an urgent uh, review of the Christmas uh, rules, the relaxation uh, of those rules, and then followed it up at Prime Minister's questions. Boris Johnson turned round to him and said it was the Labour leader who wanted to cancel Christmas. And it's also worth noting that when we were talking about this in the middle of the week, we were talking about uh, a much more uh, relaxed uh, Christmas, even with the restrictions being curtailed. So uh, instead of meeting for uh, having a five-day period, it was talk about it, that five, those five days coming down to three days in terms of the number of households that could meet. Of course, the original plan was for three households to meet. That was being talked about in terms of coming down to just two households. Now we end up in a situation for Tier 4, London and most of the southeast of England. They're not going to be able to meet with anybody. Um, on and, and then those outside of uh, tier 4 and Tiers 1, 2 and 3 are only going to be able to meet on Christmas Day, although they are going to be able to meet two other households as long as they remain e exclusive. So Keir Starmer now trying to take the agenda uh, fr from the Prime Minister and really hammer home the point that this is all too late. And of course, millions of people, millions of your list and listeners to your programme, Tom, who I'm sure you've been hearing from and will be hearing from again throughout the course of uh, your programme, frustrated, angry at the fact that they're having to cancel their Christmas plans. Um, the uh, the uh, what, what it must be like to live in Herefordshire, which I think is the only place in the country that is in Tier 1 with all this going on. I mean, it's like the People's Republic of Herefordshire over there. Um, I, I wonder, Theo, whether the question is going to focus now on when the government actually knew about the added transmissibility of this virus. Matt Hancock saying, well, last Friday he was told about it, but a decision only came uh, on Friday um, this Friday, this Friday that's just gone. Um, and of course, there's going to be a, a question about when these lockdown restrictions are going to be in place for. And euphemistically and perhaps understandably, the government is saying, look, we've got a real problem here. Yes, just to pick up on that point, of course, the, the transmissibility of this new strain of the virus. And it's worth um, emphasising the fact that nobody is suggesting at the moment, and the evidence certainly isn't there at the moment, to say it is any more dangerous or any deadlier. And it's and yep. it's not. And we know that um, we, from what we've been told by the scientists so far, it should be just as susceptible to the vaccine. So if you get vaccinated, you don't need to worry about this new strain. But the transmissibility, up to 70% more... Theo, more I'm very contagious. sorry. I'm going to have to cut across you. Uh, sorry, apologies for interrupting you, Theo. I think we can go live to Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, who is giving his press conference. Uh, as been asked to make so many sacrifices. And now, with just days to go, millions of families are having to tell children and loved ones that their plans for Christmas cannot go ahead. I know just how devastating that is. I know the hurt that people are feeling and the anger because Christmas is more than just a holiday. It's part of who we are as a nation. Sadly, the measures the government announced yesterday are necessary and we will support them. But there's no getting away from the fact and what angers people the most and frustrates me the most is that yet again, the Prime Minister waited until the 11th hour to take this decision. It was blatantly obvious last week that the Prime Minister's plan for a free-for-all over Christmas was a risk too far. And yet, rather than listening to concerns and taking them seriously, the Prime Minister did what he always does, dismissed the challenge, ruffled his hair and made a flippant comment. The Prime Minister's claim that this is all down to a new form of the virus that's only just emerged just doesn't stand up to scrutiny. On Monday last week, the Health Secretary told the House of Commons about the new strain of the virus. 
On Tuesday, medical professionals warned that the lifting of restrictions over Christmas would be, in their words, a major error. And I called for a review. On Wednesday, I challenged the Prime Minister to toughen up the restrictions. We've known about rising infections and the NHS reaching capacity in many parts of the country for weeks. The new strain was actually first spotted back in September. The alarm bells have been ringing for weeks, but the Prime Minister chose to ignore them. A virus of this sort demands early action, decisive action, a clear plan and a clear message. Yet we've had none of that. The Prime Minister delayed. He told the country to go ahead and have a merry little Christmas. He told people in London and the South East to carry on shopping and to make plans to see families. And yet, three days later, he tells millions of families to rip up those plans and introduces further restrictions. What I want to know this morning and what everyone across the country wants to know this morning is how on earth did this happen? How could the government allow people to go on as they were when they knew they'd lost control of the virus? It's an act of gross negligence by a prime minister who once again has been caught behind the curve, who once again offered confusion, not clarity, who undermined public confidence, who always overpromises and underdelivers, and who is now asking the British people to pay the price for his incompetence. No one expects the government to get it right all of the time, but a government that fails to learn from its mistakes ends up making the same mistakes over and over again, month after month, week after week. We have a Prime Minister who is so scared of being unpopular that he is incapable of taking tough decisions until it's too late. Whether that was going into the lockdown in the first place, extending the furlough scheme, bringing a circuit break in October to protect the economy, and now Christmas. It is this indecision and weak leadership that is costing lives and costing jobs. As a result, the United Kingdom ends 2020 with one of the highest death tolls in Europe, the deepest recession in any major economy, with the virus once again out of control and with Christmas cancelled for millions. My message to the Prime Minister is simple. We can't go on like this. We can't start next year as we've ended this year. Our country needs you to show political leadership. There can be no more dither, no more delay, no more fearing bad headlines, no more wishful thinking, no more empty promises. Prime Minister, you need to get the virus back under control so we can get our economy going and get our children back into school in January. The British people have done everything asked of them our NHS and social care workers have done everything asked of them and more. Our key workers, police officers, firefighters, supermarket workers and posters, they've kept us going. Our businesses have stepped up. Our communities have pulled together. Now all of them, the British people, expect their government to deliver. 2021 can be the year of recovery, but only if the government gets it right. That's why I renew my offer today to work with you and the government to get this right, to secure our economy by supporting businesses in the toughest restrictions, to protect our NHS by ensuring it's got... and to rebuild our country and safe rollout of the vaccine. These are the priorities of the British people. They are Labour priorities and they are my priorities. Finally, to everyone who's had to cancel plans, to all of you that have the increasingly familiar feeling that you've been let down or abandoned, 
who can't see an end to the gloom and the bad news, or who are having to spend Christmas alone. I'm truly sorry, but please don't lose faith. This winter will pass. This pandemic will end. And when it does, we will be reunited with our loved ones and with the places and the things we miss. And we will build a better country together. Thank you. I'll now take some questions from the media. Nick, first, I think. Morning. Um, Labour leader being, so well, pulling no punches, really, calling what the government has done an act of gross negligence, confusion, not clarity, another example of the government over-promising and under-delivering. Now, there are criticisms one could make of Sir Keir Starmer and the positions that he has taken. If it was so blatantly obvious that these rules should be uh, abandoned earlier, why didn't he suggest that earlier? But his criticism of the handling of this particular instance of this new strain of the um, virus and, frankly, of, of other parts of the government's handling of this I'm a, is absolutely spot on. You will hear Conservative MPs quietly making these kinds of criticisms as well. Um, so I think even uh, actually the truest of blue Tory voters listening may well have to concede that Keir Starmer, in some of his analysis of the government's handling of this, is spot on. Let's turn to Theo Ashwood, who's been listening to that, LBC's political editor. What did you make of it, Theo? Oh, I, I, we would love to know what you make of it, Theo, but we can't, we can't, we can't hear you. Do I have to do the thing that is now de rigueur in these situations yeah. to tell you to unmute yourself? Yeah, unmute I think that's the, 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 the phrase of 2020, isn't it? Next slide, please, uh, Theo. <laughs> right, let's start again. Apologies for that uh, technical error on my part. Keir Starmer kicked off on the point that you made at the very top um, uh, uh, after the bulletins, and that is that we knew about this new strain and we've known about it for some time. It is not, um, it is not a complete uh, swerve ball that's been thrown to the government. Keir Starmer saying that we knew about it in September and the Prime Minister failed to act back then. He's failed to act now. We've ended up in a situation where uh, only four days ago he's saying that he doesn't want to cancel his Christmas plans and yet he's dithered, he's delayed, as Keir Starmer put it, and we've found the si ourselves in the situation that we're in now that the Prime Minister has had uh, to act. Keir Starmer, interestingly, the politics of his press conference, Tom, was about pitching people against the government in terms of the sacrifices made by ordinary uh, workers, by key workers, by the NHS, by business people who desperately are seeking clarity, while Boris Johnson and Whitehall is dithering, is delaying, is not getting on with the job, and that's hurting the economy and hurting ordinary people who are having to cancel their plans. And then he finished off uh, by urging people to follow the rules, despite, of course, the heartbreak that many will be feeling that they've had to cancel their Christmas plans, looking forward to it as just some respite after such a terrible year, but urging people simply to follow uh, the rules. And, of course, we saw what was happening at train stations across London and people leaving London late last night and some people uh, mm. leave London today to try and stay, to try and uh, avoid the tier four lockdown restrictions and spend time with their family uh, in lesser, uh, under lesser restrictions over the Christmas period. So Keir Starmer uh, very much trying to take over the agenda from the Prime Minister and saying to ordinary people listening in, he's messed it up, he's got it wrong, uh, and therefore we found ourselves in this situation because of the Prime Minister. And of course, just one final point, and this is worth noting, the reason, the real reason the Prime Minister didn't act middle of the week is because Parliament was sitting and had he tried to act on this Christmas plans, you've heard already from people like Sir David uh, Amos, the Conservative MP, Craig uh, McKinley down in Thanet, very angry and wanting Parliament to be recalled. Of course, Parliament doesn't have to be recalled by, it can't be recalled by backbenchers, but the government has avoided the scrutiny of having a vote on cancelling uh, Christmas, so to speak. Uh, and that's why Boris Johnson didn't act four days ago and he acted once the MPs had broken for holiday. Interesting. Listen, Theo, thank you so much for your time. Political editor, LBC's Theo Usher, were joining us live, giving his reaction to what Sir Keir Starmer had to say. Be very interested to get your thoughts as well. 0345 6060 is the number. An act of gross negligence. Uh, the former lawyer, Sir Keir Starmer, called it. Uh, come to your thoughts on that in just a few moments. Plus, we'll be joined by a member of SAGE in a few minutes' time, Professor Catherine Noakes, who is a specialist in airborne infections and the transport of airborne pathogens, which is helpful, given we know what COVID-19 is. Uh, we'll talk about this transmissibility, the 70% transmissibility as well. Tom Swarbrick here on LBC, 11.19. This is LBC. 
Warbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Before we turn to Sage this morning, let's turn to Cynthia, new caller in Cheshunt. Hi there, Cynthia. Hello. Hello. I'm a chair and I would like to put my point across for the cancellation of the Christmas. Basically, I just sort of went through summer and I haven't even had it in time. So we're actually looking forward to spend time with our family. And when I said time, it was only two days, literally going to my daughter on Christmas Eve and then coming back on Boxing Day because I'll be working on a Boxing Day evening. Mm. So for the Prime Minister to pull, you know, to cancel everyone's Christmas, it's quite frustrating. You but know, he I'm would say, and the now, argument, and the argument mind, up until... And I don't know sorry to interrupt, Cynthia, but... Through, you know, another couple of months. I do understand, right. and at the same time, my parents from Ghana, someone actually travelled from Ghana yesterday. It's like, I can't go to Bexley, but someone could come from Africa and come to London to spend Christmas with us. So... We actually don't, you know, it's a confusing message at the moment. And it's a well, clear, so it's, it's, you don't yeah. know, you know, I'm going to people's house that they haven't been tested yet, but I'm risking my life. I went to the home where 18 people died, and after that, we are having been tested. So you haven't been tested? One day, with my family, it's not going to make any odds, because I'm already a risk going, you know, I'm an NHS volunteer, I'm doing shopping, I'm in and out of people's house every single day. And, and Cynthia, sorry to sorry to cut across you, but can I just can I just ask, based on 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 your working and and what you've had to go through over the last few months, when was the last time you were tested? When was the last time? Sorry. When was the last time you were tested? Well, I haven't been tested at all. No, I haven't. We only got. A and you're call a carer going into people's homes. Yes, we only got a call on Thursday to go and pick up the kit to and do the test. But I was working, so I couldn't go and collect my text kit. So I'm already behind. And that's, we only got a call on Wednesday, and I was working Wednesday, Thursday. And it was only an hour gap. So I couldn't leave my client to go and pick up my testing kit. So I haven't been tested. Well, listen, I've Cynthia, to I've got to say... I've got to say thank you so much for, for what you do because it is, of course, incredibly important and, and rather more dangerous than it used to be. Um, and, and please take care over Christmas and have as much of a good Christmas as you can. The idea of people not being tested regularly in those jobs is, frankly, frightening. Uh, I'll come to your calls in just a moment. Professor Catherine Noakes joins us, Professor of Environmental Engineering for Buildings at the University of Leeds, a member of SAGE, the group that advises ministers on matters of science. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning, Professor Noakes. Um, let, let's talk about the, the the transmissibility of this seventy percent more transmissible. In in reality, what does that mean? What does that look like? So yeah, we know it's more transmissible. I mean, the data is still emerging, um, so it's really hard to say exactly how much more and exactly why it's more transmissible. Um, but it does seem that it is more people who are exposed to it are more likely to become infected with this particular new variant, um, and uh, we and, need to and, figure out why. Yes, I was going to ask, does that mean it, you know, does it live on surfaces longer? Does it stay airborne for longer? How, how is it more transmissible? It's unlikely that it's living in the air for longer. It's, it's, what is more likely is that when you are exposed to it, it's, it's a more infectious strain. So it's more likely to um, bind more effectively to the receptors within you and, and therefore cause infection better. So it's, it's not that likely that it's, it's living in the environment for any longer than the previous strain was. Could you have, is there any evidence to suggest you could have both strains of this? You could have the, this, this variant and the other variant? I haven't seen any. I mean, there are cases um, around the world of reinfection. Um, they're quite small numbers at the moment. And I guess this is still emerging evidence because we don't know how long immunity lasts yet. Um, I, I note that there was a suggestion, oh gosh, it was, I think it was only five days ago, how time travels at, at this moment, but about five days ago, there was real concern about transmission between 11 and 18 year olds in particular. Is there any suggestion that this variant seems to be more common amongst that cohort? I, get, I think there is are more cases amongst that cohort, but that may well be because that cohort is mixing more than other age groups at the moment. And if you've got something that is more transmissible and more infectious, you will see it first of all in those cohorts that are mixing more. Does that mean um, 
it, it, given that that has implications for schools going back in January, doesn't it? If you've got a more transmissible virus with these people being the first group to, to get it and they mix more, what's your view on whether schools should return in full from the first week of January? So it potentially does have some implications. I think we need to see what happens over the next couple of weeks and we need to understand a little bit more about how it's spreading before we can start to make real judgments there. I mean, in the more immediate term, the risk is that if, if it's in the, the younger age groups at the moment and there is mixing with families over the Christmas period, then it spreads to older age groups who are, are much more at risk from the severe consequences of the disease. So I think so that's where well, we should yeah. be really focusing at the moment. Certainly that's where public focus should be. So it could well be that, that parents are asked to keep their kids off secondary school, in particular, for the first few weeks of January based on the spread of this virus. I, I wouldn't like to, to say what should be done at the moment, but I think at the, at the moment we would need to understand how it's spreading a bit more and then look at all the options available. Um, and with all of these things, it's a difficult set of decisions to make. Of course it is, absolutely. Um, can I ask about younger children as well, primary aged kids? Um, is there any suggestion that there's, they're spreading it about more, even asymptomatically? I haven't seen any suggestions of that. So um, it, it doesn't seem that they are any, at any more risk um, than, than any other age group at the moment. So uh, any suggestion of perhaps lowering the cutoff point for the wearing of masks, which is currently age 11 to something, you know, I don't know, nine or eight, you don't think is perhaps needed? Um, I mean, I think if, if people are able to wear masks and they're, they're younger, um, then then it's never a bad thing to do. Um, I think at the moment, oh. you know, we, we are in a position where we know this one is spreading faster. So we we have obviously got more restrictions in place now which will limit people's interactions but people will still have to have some essential interactions people will be working people will have to go to the supermarket etc and people will see, still see some family it'll be very very um, reduced and i think it's really important now that people actually sort of refocus their attentions on all the actions that we need to do ourselves to try and keep it at bay. Yes. I mean, if we think back to where we were in March, when we were, we were all a little bit terrified. Um, I wouldn't say go and be terrified, but I would say, you know, really think, um, am I doing everything I can myself? And, you know, am I always wearing my face mask properly? Am I always considering ventilation? Am I always cleaning my hands? And because I think yeah, a lot so, of so have been a little bit complacent. So mums and dads who are perhaps heading to the supermarket and having to bring um, the little ones along for childcare reasons, your advice would be to pop a mask on just out of an abundance of caution. If, they, if, the, ch if the child is willing to wear one, then there's, there's, there's no harm in it. Um, but I, obviously some children it's not going to work for. Some children love a mask yeah. though. Yeah, they, they can be, yeah, they quite quite enjoy it sometimes, but not for too long, as you say. Um, yes. So how long, I mean, again, how long's a piece of string? But it, it feels to me, uh, Professor, that we're in a bit of a race here between the spreading of this more virulent um, virus versus the rollout of the vaccine. And until the vaccine is rolled out to um, a sufficient point, we're going to have to stay in very severe restrictions up until then, aren't we? I think we are. I think we are in for a difficult couple of months ahead. I mean, once once we get towards the spring, it naturally gets easier anyway because it's easier to be outdoors and things where transmission tends to be a far less of a risk. But yeah, I I do think we, you know, the vaccine. It's fantastic that it's come along. Um, there's an enormous amount of hard work in, that's that's gone into creating that. And I should also say as well, there's an enormous amount of work. We really need to say thank you to Cog UK and Public Health England for for identifying this new variant and working on it so quickly. Um, we've really, we've only been, I, you know, really spotting the changes in the data mm. in the last few days. So we're in this until March, April, who knows? We could But it's that kind of time be. frame. Yeah. Um, but I think once we know, start to know more about how this new variant spreads and, you know, where it's spreading, then obviously those restrictions will be reviewed again. Just let me mention this, uh, which has broken relatively recently. The Netherlands is banning flights from the UK for at least the rest of the year in an attempt to make sure that the new strain of coronavirus sweeping across southern England does not reach its shores. Uh, I guess this could be the first of many bans. And secondly, do you think there is any point in doing testing or, or closing some of the borders right now? Um, I, I mean, those are difficult decisions and I think they're operational decisions. It's very difficult for me to make those judgments. <laughs> 
Uh, I won't invite you to, to see if you can uh, make those judgments anymore. Listen, Professor, have yourself a good Christmas. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Professor Catherine Noakes, Professor of Environmental Engineering for Buildings at the University of Leeds, a member of SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies that, of course, advises ministers about where the science is taking us on this. 0345 6060973. I think the Professor was pretty clear there, wasn't she? We're in this f until the vaccine comes along properly, aren't we, I'm afraid? Um, meanwhile, <laughs> if it weren't just for the pandemic, you'd be forgiven for forgetting that Brexit was ongoing. We'll be in Europe in just a few moments. We'll speak to our Europe correspondent, Lucy Hoff, about those talks, which are continuing uh, between Lord Frost and Michel Barnier about whether or not a deal can be reached uh, before the New Year's deadline. Come to your calls as well. Tom Swarbrick here, 11.32. News headlines. Bill Overton. The health secretary's admitted current lockdown measures have proved to be no barrier to the new strain of coronavirus. A new heightened tier four has been introduced across London, the southeast and parts of eastern England to cope with rising infections. Matt Hancock's told this programme the ease with which the new variant can spread has only very recently become apparent. Christmas plans across the whole of the UK have been thrown into confusion with the five-day festive break agreed by all four nations abandoned. Restrictions are now being eased for just one day and there's to be no households mixing at all in Tier 4. Wales has brought forward a third national lockdown due to start in a week. Scotland's banning people from travelling to and from the country from anywhere else in Britain. And the government's branded those who rushed to leave Tier 4 areas last night before the rules came in totally irresponsible. The weather sunny spells and blustery scattered showers across the UK. Heavier rain for Wales and the west. Drier in the east. A high of 10 degrees. This is LBC. Warbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 11.37 is the time. More breaking news this morning. This from the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps. Uh, a statement uh, saying, quote, It is incredibly important that people follow the guidance, stay at home and do not attempt to travel. Our focus must be stopping the spread of this virus, protecting lives and our NHS. If you are in Tier 4... The law means you must stay at home and you cannot stay overnight away from your home. Across the rest of the country, you must stay local. Uh, Grant Shapp says, follow the guidance and please do not come to a station unless you are permitted to travel. Extra British transport police officers are being deployed to ensure only those who need to take essential journeys can travel safely. Um, can you imagine reading that a year ago? So there are now extra police across train stations in the capital, questioning people about whether their journey on a train is going to be essential, given the restrictions that now stand in law in these Tier 4 areas. Um, let's come to Charlene, who's in Reading this morning. Hi, Charlene. Oh, good morning to you. How are you today? Morning. Yes, very well, thank you. Well, you know, as well as can be. I think we're all muddling through here, aren't we, really? Yes, yes, we certainly are. And I, I just want to say, as, um, first of all, it's thank you to all those frontline workers, um, whether you're working in a shop, um, or you're a nurse or a doctor, uh, but my heart really goes out to those small businesses, pubs, restaurants yeah. that have spent so much money trying to get their areas COVID safe. And I'm really um, disgusted at the way this government has handled it. Um, I'm, I, I, I spend a lot of time on social media. Everyone does during the pandemic, um, but there's so much argument and so much hate towards each other that is really disgusting me during such um, a time where we should be really kind. And that's what... It's mainly about, sorry, I'm getting quite upset about it. No, no, well, well, listen, well said, well said, because there are plenty of people who are going to be having to work extremely hard under very, very yes. difficult conditions. Yeah, the fingers that are pointed is absolutely disgusting. One finger points at you, two point back at, at, at yourself at the end of the day. So it's just absolutely disgusting. It needs to stop. Um, there's perfect good examples from other countries that our government should be um, following, we've got um, Barbados, where they, they've tested the whole of their community. Every mm. week, you have to be tested. Dur during um, From March to um, June, everyone was tested but that's throughout the whole entire country. If you want to visit that country, you have to have a COVID-19 test. Our borders yeah. should not be open. And I understand um, there has been a change in the virus um, just because of the lack of control. And we haven't been able to get it under control because of the opening of schools. But we well, shouldn't be blaming the schools. We shouldn't be blaming anyone but the government and their lack 
Oh, well, I, listen, I think, I think there, are, there are definitely... Charlene, thank you, by the way, and I understand the emotion, particularly, particularly this morning. Uh, there are definitely things that the government should be blamed for, and as I've, I think <laughs> I've, I've tried to make as clear as possible, the, the way in which they have handled the Christmas opening has been utterly, utterly shambolic. I mean, I, I, I've honestly never known anything like it in, in terms of how to set expectations for people and then destroy them at the, almost the last possible moment. But I think the ultimately... The spread of this virus is down to the virus itself being spread amongst people who are coming into contact with one another. Now, I agree about testing, mass testing. I agree that we should have uh, people tested as regularly as possible, particularly those who are going into other people's homes and at schools too. And of course, the government has made mistakes. Um, but there's more to it, I think, than just blaming the government. And of course, the government is a very, very big thing. There are individual constituent parts of the government that have, have had better or worse um, decision-making periods during this pandemic. Um, if you look at some of the decisions by HMRC versus some of those by Public Health England, I think you can come to your own conclusions. 0345 6060973 is my number. Look, we've got decisions to be made over Brexit as well in the coming few hours. Uh, let's turn to how those talks are progressing and indeed what we expect the talks to conclude on. Uh, Heidi Huatala is the Vice President of the European Parliament and Green MEP for Helsinki in Finland. Thank you very much for joining the programme this morning. Uh, we seem to be stuck on fishing. Um, what the, the, and the EU's request uh, is like that asked of no other country in the world. It's unreasonable. Well, I think um, uh, you have to take into account the common market interests and the access from both sides. And I, I truly, of course, hope that uh, by tonight uh, they will find an agreement somewhere, uh, to be, whether it will be 20 or 60 percent. But um, it has to be something that both sides will accept. And of course, it's a, it's a big thing. I un understand that the, the EU has no problem of uh, sovereignty of the coastal waters of the UK, but it's still about market access and uh, a fair transition. But this um, is not the only thing that they are discussing now. I no, no, I, I agree. But the, all the, the, the rhetoric seems to be about whether or not, as you say, to agree on, on that particular shifting quotas 20% or 60%. The principal point is that the UK should be able to decide for itself with all the consequences that may follow for its decisions some point in the future, rather than being bound um, by EU rules, whether it's a raising of standards or not, the so-called level playing field. Um, does it, do you think it gets lost in translation, that key demand from the UK? Well, I think it's it's lost in, in translation in the modern world to talk about um, uh, sovereignty. And um, I think the closer to the uh, Brexit uh, date, the 31st of December, we get, the more often we hear uh, sovereignty. But uh, from the EU point of view, come on, uh, this is a world where we need, we need transnational cooperation and pooling our sovereignties, fair deals so that we can... Uh, work across national borders. So I find it totally pathetic to continue to speak about sovereignty in the modern world. And I, I'm sure that the UK and the EU will um, start uh, to discuss common issues like uh, climate change uh, as soon as they are over this, this difficult period. So that's you think again national not about sovereignty. You think national sovereignty is pathetic? Yes. I do, because uh, you have to pull your sovereignties in the modern world. Because but do you get a decision on? Do you get a de do you get to decide as a nation, as as people who vote for those who lead the nation? Do do we get a say in what sovereignty we pull and for what reasons? Yeah, yes, of or do course. Do we just but, assume uh, that we're pulling it? Okay, well then uh, let's look at another aspect of, of the question of sovereignty. I'm, I'm, it worries me at the moment that neither the Westminster Parliament nor the European Parliament has full access to the negotiation uh, documents. So um, I think um, there's also the parliamentary sovereignty question. And the European Parliament has been put into a quite difficult corner because we are used to, to scrutinising uh, international agreements very carefully. But, of course... Uh, if uh, Barnier comes back with a fair deal, we will do everything starting tomorrow morning to, to look at it. And I, I truly hope that the Westminster Parliament will have uh, at least the same rights as, as we to, to scrutinise this, mm. uh, this agreement. So, well, they're asking, um, they're asking to be recalled over the coronavirus restrictions, but I guess the government would yeah. have to recall it in order to get a vote through um, over the next few days if, if a deal is agreed. Uh, do you think there is a chance, just finally, that uh, this deal could be scuppered by the European Parliament, that there are circumstances in which certain members of the European Parliament would vote this down? And what effect would that have? 
Well, uh, we don't have the, the UKIP members anymore, as you know, so that's a bit of a relief in this question. But uh, but I, I can hardly believe that Michel Barnier would bring back something that the European Parliament and the EU member states could not uh, accept. Okay. Because the Parliament has been kept so well informed about this. Just at this moment, when we have to scrutinize the package, we don't have access to it. But we will do everything to, to, to make sure that there is a deal and that it will be either ratified by the end of the year or that there will be special arrangements. Yes, I was going to ask you, final question was, how long do you think you're going to need as a parliament to scrutinise what is going to be a very, very long document if indeed one emerges? Well, that, that's, that's a very good question because, you know, sometimes it takes four and a half years to negotiate a trade agreement with Japan. And this this has been completed over nine months and uh, days are getting scarce. So, uh, but um, we will have 11 or 12 committee meetings during Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday to, to, to do our utmost to understand what will be agreed um, subject to an agreement by tonight. So let's hope that there will be a deal. But you're not putting a time limit on it, just finally. We don't think we're going to have to well, extend transition or just come to an arrangement about uh, lorries crossing the border or flight paths or anything like that. Well, um, uh, look, uh, the deadline has been set by the UK, the 31st of January, no, sorry, December. And uh, of course, uh, we can say that uh, there will be a provisional agreement uh, which will be applied uh, after the this end date. It's not very comfortable because then the parliament would only say yes or no uh, in January without really being able to influence. And the contingency measures are, of course, there. So... Uh, uh, there, there will be options, but the Parliament has said that it will not ratify during the last uh, remaining days of 2020 uh, if um, there is no agreement by midnight tonight, Central European time. So we have still around the clock to go. Yeah, it's getting tight though, isn't it? Heidi, thank you very much indeed. Heidi Hautala, who is the Vice President of the European Parliament and a Green MEP for Helsinki in Finland. 03456060973 is my number. Very keen to get your thoughts on everything that we've heard this morning, whether it's for, gosh, it, sounds, it feels like a long time ago, doesn't it? It's only 45 minutes or so ago that Sir Keir Starmer stood up and uh, batted the government for an act of gross negligence in how it has handled this easy, this tightening of Christmas restrictions. Very keen to get your thoughts on what Grant Shapps has said too. The Transport Secretary saying extra police will now be deployed uh, at train stations in Tier 4 areas to discover whether your train journey this th at this point or indeed in the days to come is actually essential i wonder whether you think that that is a move that is needed given the new um transmissibility the higher transmissibility of this virus and indeed travel bans too you're seeing countries netherlands i also understand belgium too it has also put a travel ban on on uh people making their way to those countries from england it's it, perhaps we don't need to close our borders is that the rest of the world is closing down to us right now 0345 973 your thoughts in just a moment tom swarbrick here 1148 Nick Ferrari at breakfast, LBC. The return next month to school will be delayed by up to a week, with head teachers told to get an army of parents and volunteers to help carry out the testing of teenagers. Nick Gibb, who's schools minister and, of course, a Conservative MP. Minister, why is it so last minute? We have been piloting testing in schools over the last few weeks, and we have to respond at pace to changes. So you don't think, with hindsight, it could have been given to the schools or could have been made aware a little earlier? No, we want to roll out, to announce things as swiftly as we can. Nick Ferrari at Breakfast, weekday mornings from 7, LBC. This is LBC, Swarbrick on Sunday, with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. Call 0345 6060 973, tweet at LBC, text 84850. For what it's worth, and it may be worth very, very little, I've just seen some new polling done by YouGov on the Tier 4 restrictions and the handling of the, the Christmas um, relaxation. 61% uh, say that the government has badly handled the COVID Christmas rules. 33% say they've handled it well. If you are part of that 33%, I've got a bridge to sell you. 0345 6060 is the number. Let's get more on these countries that have banned flights uh, into them from the UK, particularly from England. Lucy Hoff is LBC's Europe correspondent. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning, Lucy. Um, tell us why the, which countries these are and why they've banned these flights. 
Well, Tom, this started with the Netherlands, which announced these changes this morning. Belgium is now following suit, and we're told that Germany is also likely to bring in uh, a ban as well. In the case of Belgium, not only have they banned flights in and out of uh, Belgium for UK travellers, they've also suspended the rail service. So that means uh, a lot of people travelling on the Eurostar today. The Netherlands has banned air travel, and as I say, Germany expected to make a decision on this uh, a little bit later on. Other European countries countries may follow suit. But I mean, clearly the ramifications for the, uh, European travellers, this is absolutely huge. People here that were due to be travelling home for Christmas, uh, living in Belgium, the same in the Netherlands. So we also have the British negotiating team uh, here in Brussels. Uh, no indication yet on what that might mean for them. David Frost might be spending Christmas inside the Berlaymont at this rate. But uh, yeah, a huge amount of disruption. There is clear concern from European countries about bringing this uh, strain, it's being called the, the British COVID-19 strain here, into those sure. countries. So some drastic action being taken to prevent that from happening. Yes, the symbolism is hard to miss, I'm afraid. Um, the, so is there any um, sort of ability for anybody to get across, presumably for work reasons, they must allow business businesses to move across the continent and under the channel or over the channel? Yeah, I, I'm sure that there will be some loopholes for yeah. essential travel, be it for work. But at the moment, I mean, Eurostar services from here are suspended. There are currently no trains. I mean, this is a much more drastic measure than those travel restrictions we saw at the start of this pandemic. This is really about suspending the physical services themselves. So, of course, there may be loopholes for people. Some more detail on that will emerge over the course of today. But this does appear to be quite a drastic step, at least in Belgium's case, this is a 24-hour ban uh, with the Belgian Prime Minister Alexander de Croix saying he'll make a more informed decision on Tuesday. But in the case of the Netherlands, uh, we're told that all air travel will be banned for UK travellers until at least the end of the year. Uh, so yeah, much more drastic than what we saw at the start of this pandemic. And as you say, the direction of travel is that more and more European countries are going to have to unfortunately seemingly bring in these kinds of bans. Lucy, great to talk to you. Enjoy Christmas in, in Christ, Christmas in Brussels. Lucy Hoff, LBC's Europe correspondent. Just astonishing, this, isn't it? I mean, absolutely astonishing. David is in workshop. Hi there, David. Hello. Yeah, I'll be very quick because I know we've got much time. Uh, just a couple of things. I think it's diabolical when we've got a national pandemic. The MPs, it's just a bit convenient as well. They managed to swan out of Tier 2. And the majority of them will be out of the uh, ramifications of the tier to up north, etc. We should be recalling Parliament, they should not be allowed to go in a national crisis. Imagine a Second World War and they can swan off home for a couple of weeks when the Luftwaffe are attacking us. One quick last point and then I'll go. Uh, Grant Shapps talks about more police uh, yes. monitoring people travelling. Oh, I'd like to know who's monitoring the MPs. I hope the media are keeping an eye on what the MPs are doing because they have basically shut down thousands and thousands of business, thousands of people's jobs. Well, actually, actually, I think, I think MPs who are um, implacably opposed, or at least rather more cynical and um, sceptical of these restrictions, would say that it is not they who have shut them down, it is the government that have done this. No, I appreciate it, but the ones who voted for the lockdown... Uh, I've yes. Voted for the, well, the, but the thing is, David. D listen, I, I, I'm, I have been uh, as sceptical as as one can about these restrictions and about the the premise on which we are asked to lock down, um, and have looked at the figures, questioned the, the the data that's coming in, and the cases, and the hospitalizations, and everything like that. There is no other option. I mean, no, th that's, that's the, the conclusion. I think the only conclusion that most people come to about this is there's nothing else here. There's the you, vaccine. You Thank God you we've got the vaccine. You're missing the point. The point is it should be fair and MPs and celebrities should abide by the rules. Like of course, the everybody should abide by the rules. Everybody should abide but by the not, rules. they're not, Well, no, not everybody is, unfortunately, whether they're MP, celebrity or but, David in workshop. I'm sure you are, David. That's a, a slur on your reputation. Thank you very much indeed for your call. Paul's in Manchester. Paul. Hi, how are you? Excuse Good, the, the background noise. I'm in Piccadilly Gardens at the moment. No worries. Manchester. Okay. Beautiful Manchester. Yeah, I just Tell us what know. you're I'm seeing. Just, I'm, just, I'm just walking my dog and um, I was talking to people and people always ask me, you know, what kind of dog? And then they ask where I'm from. And after speaking to them, they got out of the van, like a 15 passenger van, and just were talking. And I said, well, where you're from? Luton. And I just happened to ask, you know, we, we're talking. They're in Manchester Christmas shopping today. Because apparently Who the are? shops in London are all closed. 
Who? Oh, I see. So people have driven up from Luton to Manchester to do the shopping. Yeah, yeah. And I was, you know, I wasn't sure if the sh- I knew the shops were going to be closing, but I wasn't sure when it was. But you know, I, apparently they're shut. So they're in our. They are. Yeah, Manchester absolutely. They're not at all. All non-essential retail has been shut in tier four areas. Paul, that is astonishing. You're saying that a, a, a mini bus load of people have just pulled up in Manchester saying they're from Luton to do their shopping. I do wonder about this traveling around the country. You know, we saw those scenes at King's Cross. Uh, Paul, thank you, by the way. Mind how you go on your dog walk. We saw those scenes at King's Cross last night in other stations in London. Uh, we've heard from Grant Shapps, the transport secretary, that the travel, uh, that the British Transport Police are going to be stationed there to check whether your journey is essential. What are we talking about here? Are we talking about stopping the trains? Are we talking about roadblocks? How how do we manage this now? On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 12 o'clock, the Health Secretary's admitted lockdown measures have proved to be no barrier to the new strain of coronavirus. A new heightened tier fours come in across London, the south, the eastern parts of eastern England to cope with rising infections. As in November, it means no households mixing and non-essential retail having to close. The Health Secretary Matt Hancock's told Swarbrick on Sunday they only recently realised something was wrong. We know that the November lockdown and did not work against this new variant because the cases carried on rising in Kent. That's how we spotted that there was a new variant that was having this impact in the first place because we were puzzled by why is it going up in Kent when it's coming down quite sharply everywhere else in the country. Professor Catherine Noakes is part of the SAGE group which advises the government. She's told LBC they don't believe the new virus variant is any more dangerous. What is more likely is that when you are exposed to it, it's it's a more infectious strain. So it's more likely to bind more effectively to the receptors within you and, and therefore cause infection better. So it's it's not that likely that it's, it's living in the environment for any longer than the previous strain was. It's meant the government cancelling festive plans for millions of people. Jen's from Camberley and South almost all of which falls in the new toughest tier. She's been reducing contact with others in preparation to see her family, which now can't happen. Both households have done a mini self-isolation so that we would be sure that we were well before we started travelling. It's prompted a rush to escape some areas. These people caught one of the last trains to Edinburgh last night. I just feel so incredibly lucky to be on that train. My first train was cancelled and then I got on that train. And we stopped at York. For a long time. For a long time (laughs) and we thought, actually, is this because we're not going to be able to get back up? I'm just lucky I'm home for Christmas. In Scotland, Wales and parts of England not in Tier 4. The five-day relaxation of Covid rules has been reduced to just Christmas Day. Wales has gone into another national lockdown with Scotland and Northern Ireland due to do so on Boxing Day. MPs say there's an urgent need to publish a list of companies receiving furlough money following up concerns about fraud. The Public Accounts Committee says it's worried about opportunistic companies claiming the cash while staff carry on working. Its chair, Meg Hillier, says the government and HMRC need to clamp down together. They do need to find ways of making it easy for those companies who may have made a mistake inadvertently or realise now perhaps they shouldn't have made an error to come forward. But obviously where there's egregious fraud, then we would want to see tough action by HMRC and the government. The scheme, which pays 80% of wages for workers impacted by the virus, has been extended until April. A dairy farmer's playing Christmas carols to his herd at his farm in the Wicklow Mountains as he claims it helps the cows produce better milk. At other times of the year, Joe Hayden soothes his Frisians with music by Bruce Springsteen and the Killers, his cattle, have supplied a famous liqueur brand with cream since the 1970s. So we'll drink to that. LBC Weather. With Halls, help is at hand this winter. Sunny spells and blustery showers across the UK. Heavier rain for Wales in the west with a chance of hail and thunder. Dry further east and a high of 10 degrees. From Global's newsroom, I'm Bill Overton. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. 
Very good afternoon to you. Four minutes past noon is the time you're listening to Tom Swarbrick here on LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday, also available for you on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook. The all-out assault on your senses continues this Sunday afternoon. Um, Listen, let me just run through some of the restrictions that apply now to Tier 4 areas. This is the new tier that was brought in yesterday for London, parts of the South East and the East of England. So, from this morning... Uh, hairdressers, nail bars, indoor gyms and leisure facilities in Tier 4 areas all must close. People must work from home if they can. People in Tier 4 can now only meet one other person outside of your home, uh, which is down from six. While outdoor sports courts, outdoor gyms and swimming pools and golf courses can remain open for individual exercise and for people to use uh, with others within their household support bubble or with one person from another household, organised outdoor sport for under 18s and disabled people will also be allowed. But this feels a, more akin to a March-style lockdown than it does to anything else we have hitherto seen. Uh, confirmation too from the Health Secretary on the programme this morning that November's lockdown didn't work in getting cases down because of this new variant of the virus. As we heard a little earlier in the programme, Grant Schatz, the Transport Secretary, worried about seeding this uh, new variant across other parts of the country, has stationed, or uh, asked to station, more British Transport Police officers at train stations across London to question those who are making journeys as to whether whether or not their journey is essential. Uh, If you are someone who has either arrived back home having left London or parts of Tier 4 areas over the past few hours, or you intend to, do you, are you ready to be questioned? Do you think it is sensible to have police stationed at these places in order to try and stop people from travelling around the country right now? 0345 973 is the number. Do you think that that should happen at the border too, that we should just cancel international flights for a period of time? Uh, we'll speak to Vaughan Gething later on, the health minister in Wales, uh, who has suggested uh, that the new variant is, quote, seeded in all parts of Wales, including the north. So we'll talk to Vaughan Gething a bit later about what is going on in Wales. Andy Trotter joins us right now, former Chief Constable for the British Transport Police. Thank you for being there for us this afternoon, Mr Trotter. Um, so your, your former colleagues are going to be stationed around to question people about their journey. Are you clear, are they clear about what we mean by essential? I think their role today is, is what it always is. It'll be about helping people. It'll be about um, educating. It'll be about guiding. It'll be about helping people ensure that they comply with the regulations, particularly around wearing masks and things such as that. But their approach all along has been about assisting uh, and, and enforcement as the very, very last part of that. I mean, I can't speak for them, obviously, anymore, but I'd be surprised if their primary job today was anything to do with checking people, where people are going. It's much more to do with very, very crowded uh, trains and railway stations and helping people get about their business. The um, Presumably, though, the after the sort of consultation with the potential passion, the passenger about not only where they're going, but why they're going there, um, presumably a British Transport Police officer could say, I'm really sorry, you can't go. Uh, they, I mean, they, it would be certainly possible once it, you know, everyone's clear around the regulations, but there's a lot of complexity to this as well. And I really don't think this is their number one role today. I mean, you think of how many people were travelling last night through St Pancras and, and Euston and, and Leeds uh, and um, King's Cross. Um, it would be impossible for them to go checking everybody that's scrambling onto those trains. It's the last thing they could possibly do. It's much more around assisting people. And that goes for the police everywhere today. It's about helping people people through this. It's about dealing with very serious breaches of the the law, but it's not about, in my opinion, it's not about trying to interrogate people as to the purpose of their journey and where they're going. I might be wrong, but I don't think I am. I think their job today is much more about assisting people. To what extent do you think we need greater interrogation of this. Given this this virus is is much more transmissible now, we know, given it's coming from this particular area of the country, the South, South East and London, is it, is it not wise to be tougher on people who are looking to leave uh, in a way that is against the rules now, against the law even? There's a certain practicality to this, isn't there? People are out on the road today travelling to different places. That's right. And they're, 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 we're all learning what these rules mean. We're all sitting down and reading them to see what does this exactly mean for us. We're all changing our Christmas plans. There'd be some desperately worried and upset people. And there'd be exceptions and exemptions to these rules as well. So the police will be learning their, their way through this today. But as I say, you know, you think of the things they've got to be dealing with at the moment. They're, they're dealing with all of these pressures in the transport hubs, dealing with some people out there... Still demonstrating in central London against these yeah. things. 
they're very, very busy dealing with a range of other things. And the police have really evolved into this role throughout the pandemic, of one which is around assisting and helping enforcement as the last thing they want to do. But there were people who will take them on today, there were people who will challenge them, there will be people who are looking for problems. You know, and this is affecting everyone in shops, it's affecting everyone in transport hubs. And they'll be dealing with conflict between people who do, you know, who don't want to help, who don't want to comply. But the last thing they want to do is enforce. They will do if they have to. But I certainly don't see their primary role today as putting in road checks or putting in checks at stations say, where are you going? I think the sheer practicalities of that, even if they wanted to, would defeat them in all of this. Okay. Andy Trotter, really good to speak to you. Thank you very much for coming on the programme. Andy Trotter, former Chief Constable for the British Transport Police. If you are... For whatever reason, and your reason would be against the law right now if you're leaving a Tier 4 area, if you are planning to go about uh, and try and get back somewhere for Christmas, 0345 6060973 about whether you've decided against it or you're going to take the law into your own hands. Uh, let's get around the United Kingdom. Vaughan Gething joins us, Minister for Health and Social Services in the Welsh Government, Labour Assembly Member for Cardiff, South and Penarth. Thank you for coming on the programme. Um, you've described the uh, new strain of the virus as being seeded in all parts of Wales, including the north. Um, how are you certain of that? Afternoon to you. Uh, afternoon. Well, there are two things that help to inform that. The first is... Uh, we have had a sample of about 6,000 cases from Wales that have gone to one of the labs that can test for the new strain effectively. And 11% of the returns uh, came back with the new strain. Now, that's likely to be an under-representation because we're seeing our cases surge most significantly in the south. Uh, the sample that went out, though, um, of that number of positive cases for the new strain, over 22% were from North Wales. So that doesn't mean North Wales has a disproportionate amount of the new cases. What it does mean is that this is prevalent in every part of the country. And the ONS um, infection survey uh, returned, I think, 28% of positive cases from around Wales with the new strain as well. And again, that's likely to be an under-representation, but it does show in every part of Wales the new virus is present, and that helps to underscore why we've taken national action. When did you learn this? Uh, well, we knew that there was a new strain. We only really learned developing during this week quite how significant it was in terms of the addition to transmission, and that's why events have moved so quickly, uh, because we couldn't be certain that it really was as significantly more transmissible as it is. Once we then understand that, then we've got to act. And that's why uh, we met yesterday. That's why we took the action that we did. And the picture really has changed literally within the last day or two. And I know the new measures will be frustrating. There'll be people who are angry and upset at the impact on their Christmas but we've got a Responsibility Act for Wales to make sure that more people mm. can celebrate future life events. Um, why was it then that, that Mr Drakeford um, decided to, to try this sort of four-nation approach to Christmas relaxation when, it, as you say, it was becoming clear throughout the last seven to ten days that there was a new, vir new viral strain and it was much more transmissible? Well, to be fair, it wasn't during the last seven to ten days it became clear there was a new, much more transmissible strain of the virus. But well, again, we could Mr. That with respect, Mr Gething, Mr Hancock stood in the House of Commons on Monday to say that a new strain of the virus was there and that it was uh, re responsible for uh, many of the cases uh, and many more of the cases that had come in the southeast. He was also clear that it might be more transmissible, but we didn't have the certainty about that. What we did know was we had a significant package of ca of cases and infection rates going through South Wales. That's why we went away from the Four Nation approach. We, in the Four Nation meetings that took place earlier this week, um, the First Minister of Wales argued for a reduction in household mixing across the UK. We couldn't reach agreement and we reached the difficult decision at the time to move away from that and to reduce household mixing with the first UK nation to do that was because of our it? circumstances. Who well, was opposing the, that? We, well, we were the only country at that time who were arguing for that. But I don't think that... The, you have to understand, we're in a materially different position to all of other course, UK I, I, countries. I, 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 go on. Yes, sorry, I interrupted. And so I'm, I'm not seeking to criticise other governments for the choice they made at the time. But even since that meeting, the evidence base has changed again. And we do now have much more certainty about the prevalence of the new strain, about the direct evidence that we can be, I'm afraid, awfully certain now it is much more transmissible. 
And so that's why we've had to act as we have done here in Wales. And there are always difficult balances and you recognise there's harm on either side of each choice you make. But this is really about keeping people alive and keeping people safe. And so that explains, does it, the um, bringing in of a lockdown with just seven hours notice? Yes, it does. And it's not a decision that I relish or any other Welsh government has to relish of taking. But because you know that there will be people who will be generally upset, people who really will feel that Christmas has been ruined. But I'd ask everybody to consider that this isn't just about ruining one Christmas. It's about how many of us can complete the journey we're on. The pandemic will end. We've got a vaccine. We expect we'll have more vaccines available. This is about how we keep people safe and alive now and recognise the impact that our behaviour has on other people. It's not just a concern for ourselves, it's a concern for all of us. And finally, what is the situation in Wales when it comes to the capacity of intensive care units and intensive care beds in hospitals? We're currently tracking for confirmed coronavirus cases above our reasonable worst case scenario. So we have over 1,500 confirmed COVID patients in all beds in Wales. The reasonable worst case scenario was we might reach that point at Christmas Day. So we've hit the Christmas Day peak six days early. Intensive care beds, we have about 200 intensive care beds filled, but our normal capacity is 152. So overall, we're above our normal capacity, and that's because we're having to restrict other services to redeploy staff so we can actually staff those beds in a critical care setting. So that's how serious it is already. And that's why we really need people to recognise the moment of risk and threat that we face really does require a national response, and we all need to play our part. Does the NHS in Wales face something close to being overrun then? based on those numbers? I mean, that is ter- that is slightly, well, it's more than concerning. <laughs> well, it, it's hugely concerning uh, and it's deeply troubling. And that's why we have health boards in Wales already acting on the um, authorisation I've given to reduce other forms of treatment. You can't carry on as if everything is normal when this is happening as well. So that's why having to reduce other treatments and that will cause frustration and harm for some people. But if we don't do that, then our service could get overrun. And that is a difficult balance for people to actually deliver operationally. And it's difficult if you're the person waiting in pain for treatment. Mm. But the alternative is that that might cost someone else's life. And we're still asking our staff to put themselves in harm's way while some people are still opposing and not wanting to buy into the level of threat that we face. So we've got really difficult days ahead of us. But as I say, we can all be part of the answer. And just sorry to push on this one more time, but is, is your is is the Nightingale available? Uh, is that a facility that is available to Wales, an NHS Nightingale facility? Yeah, we've already got field hospitals in Wales that are open. Uh, there are field hospitals in Bridgend that are accepting people. There's a field hospital open in North Wales, a field hospital in West Wales. We've also got something like field hospital facilities in Gwent as well. And the challenge with the field hospitals isn't the beds, it's the staff. Because we're also dealing with high levels of staff sickness and absence, either because they've got COVID or they're self-isolating. Well, I might be out of date on this, Mr. Gethin, but the the last time I checked, uh, there were about a thousand medically trained armed uh, armed forces personnel um, in reserve. Do you think that, that, I mean, given the situation in Wales in particular, it feels like there could become a moment shortly when field hospitals are staffed by medically trained Um, army medics. Do you think that's a possibility? Well, anything's possible. We've already got some assistance from armed services with the ambulance service uh, in terms of turning around and uh, re-preparing vehicles. We've got assistance with the army in a whole range of things. They really have been incredibly supportive and can do throughout this. I wouldn't rule anything out, but at this point in time, we are still looking to staff our field hospitals with people who work across health and social care, and that's about making really difficult choices about what other things may not happen so we can try to keep people alive. Try and have yourself as good a Christmas as you possibly can. Vaughan Gething, thank you very much indeed for your time. Minister for Health and Social Services and the Welsh Government Labour Assembly Member for Cardiff South and Penarth. Wow. 0345 6060 973. Again, it's, it's not even worth trying to uh, put what is uh, said as fact at the moment um, in the context of, say, last year. You know, again... It, 
if it were approaching Christmas 2019 and someone told you that in 12 months you'd be talking about field hospitals being set up in Wales to deal with the pandemic, they wouldn't have believed you. Come to your calls in just a moment. Tom Swarbrick here, 1218. LBC. This is LBC Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. Afternoon to you, talking about this travel situation, particularly from Tier 4 areas around the country. We saw the scenes across train stations in the capital last night, in King's Cross and in Euston as well. People trying to uh, get out and get home for Christmas, given that um, the Christmas five days of freedom had now been curtailed. Uh, Michael's tweeted, at Tom Swarbrick 1 this morning, a friend who had booked to travel to Yorkshire last night from St Pancras back in November... Uh, said he had no social distancing. The train company should have questions to answer. Why were they still selling tickets to walk-on passengers last night, asks Michael. Simon's in Bedford. Hi there, Simon. Hi, good afternoon, Tom. Hello, sir. Your thoughts? Um, so, uh, first of all, I'm absolutely appalled and disgusted that what I heard earlier was that a, a, a coach full of people from Luton had arrived in Manchester to do their shopping. I mean, I, I live in Bedford. Luton is my sort of neighbouring yeah. town in Bedfordshire. And it's just that that's my area. And I'm thinking to myself, why would you do that? That's just ridiculous. You know, I, I get that people are angry, upset, frustrated. It, you know, this time next year will be a completely different scenario. You know, for just one year, we are having to sacrifice quite a lot. I, I do get that. I understand the frustrations. Um, in terms of, you know... Just order it on that, Amazon would be my... I mean, well, why well, on absolutely. earth would you drive for three hours to go to Manchester, to go to, I don't know, the Trafford Centre or somewhere, uh, as wonderful as the Trafford Centre may be, to just order it online. Come on, everyone else Absolutely. Is. I mean, that's the way of the world today. I mean, everybody orders things online. You don't need to go on a coach for however many hours to get to Manchester to go out. It's just absolutely ridiculous. And I feel ashamed that there are people from an area that I live in. I mean, I'm in a tier four area now and I'm a bit of a quandary because I'm a single parent and mm. my mum is my support bubble, but she lives in Northamptonshire and she's tier two. And I'm confused now because am I allowed to have a support bubble? Yes, I am. But am I allowed to have a support bubble that's in tier two? Yes or no? And I can't find, it's a very woolly grey area on the government's website that I can't find an actual definitive answer to. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about that. We had similar uh, conversations in our house. We're in tier four as well, but fortunately the, uh, my mother-in-law is in the same bubble as us and in the same, is in the same tier as us. So that makes, makes life a little easier. It um, does. But that 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 clarification, Simon, is going to be needed for a lot of people. So your your plan is you're going to you're going to bubble up on Christmas Day for a bit. That was my plan, but to be honest with you, you know, I'm more than happy to be at home on my own on Christmas Day. It, it really doesn't bother me just for the sake of one year, because you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's yes, it's here. It's not going anyway, going away anywhere anytime soon. But I, I can cope with that. You know, um, it, it, I'm happy to stick to the rules because it does make sense. Why would I? expect to cross over into a two into tier two when i'm tier four yeah. and risk yeah. you know even if i am fit and healthy um, you know you know a lot of people are asymptomatic and you just it's just not worth it um but well I'm, listen simon it, I, I i i largely agree with you about about the the rules around this and i think actually the vast majority of people came to that decision actually despite uh, what the government was was due to announce with these five days of of uh, you know ignoring the tiered system over the period of christmas i think I think the vast majority of people looked at it and thought, you must be mad. Simon, thank you very much indeed. Uh, to Paris, here's James. Hi there, James. Hi. Hey, uh, what's the situation like where you are then? Um, well, I was, uh, the reason I'm ringing, I was, I was listening to your interview of um, that apologist for uh, police incompetence. I think he was called Trotter. Is that right? Mr Andy Trotter, yes, former um, Chief Constable of British yeah. Transport Police. Well, he's, in my view, he's totally incompetent. Um, what I want to, the point I want to make is um, I've been living in France since February this year, and when, when they set up the restrictions on travel, the only way you could go anywhere was to fit out an attestation, a written attestation. And if you were stopped and didn't have it with you, you were immediately fined 135 euros. Wow. Now... Yet again, Johnson has set something up, half-cock. What he should have done is exactly that 
type of situation that nobody can go anywhere without having an attesta- a written attestation, and it had to be signed and dated uh, on the, for that day on which you were stopped by the by the gendarmes. Now the gendarmes James, enforced I, I, it. Pro- the gendarmes enforced it properly. That's In fact, great. At one point, and, I think and, I was stopped four days running. Really, right. So I, I understand that, but at the same time, that the the you know all the process and bureaucracy that that would take, plus I'm afraid the ill feeling that no, would come not. with an announcement like that. Well, hang on a sec. The ill feeling that would come with an announcement like that, and the sort of There's affront no to general feeling. freedom. We well, just but wait the a French, second. The French, French, the French, the French didn't complain about it. Well, All look at the riots. The look at, I, I would point you the to the protests in your own city, be... sir. But but James, listen, because arguably you could say that as well as you know as much as a system like that is tougher than what we've got here in the in the UK France's coronavirus rates are still very very high what what actual good has it done do you think but it wasn't at that time it plummeted right so has the situation eased off when it comes to the checking of papers like the UK it varies <clears throat> right in fact, so I, can tell you exactly you go, how many people, I can tell you exactly how many people died from coronavirus yesterday. 190. Hmm. How, many, how many died in the UK? It's a lot more, I'm afraid. James, listen, I appreciate it. Thank you for the call. Uh, Renata's in Ealing. Hi there, Renata. Hello. Hi. Hello. You're on Hello. the radio. What would you like to say? <laughs> I just wanted to say um, that I have... Um, mm, suffered a lot during the pandemic. I had personal loss. I lost my mum. Oh, I'm so and, sorry. Um, and um, two days ago, my my dad, yes, two days ago, my dad said he wasn't well. So yesterday morning, I decided to buy the ticket, um, flight ticket. I quickly um, reserved the ticket. I went to uh, print out the boarding passes. And I came back, my husband says that uh, we are in tier four. And we've got restrictions, and I cannot go. So uh, I just whole situation left me very um, confused, um, traumatic experience overall. But I think it's the right thing to do. I listened to uh, Boris Johnson' um, announcement, and at the end, he specifies. He says this is for our own safety. This is for for future Christmases. And I think that's the right thing to do. And um, I'm just happy to stay here and do do the right thing and um, just, just comply with, with the rules and and the law enforcement. Where were you due to fly to, Renata? To Poland. <laughs> to Poland, right. To see your dad. To, yes, to see my yeah. dad. Mm, mm, and he's, he uh, and forgive me... But he, him not being well, plus the fact that you've yes. um, so but poorly lost, lost your mother, ma- I mean, yes, must be incredibly yes. t- difficult for him. It is, it is. He's got very good neighbours. The neighbours knocked on his door and um, they said they called me and they said uh, they will be in touch during Christmas and they will be looking after him. Yeah. So that's, we've got incredible community there. But it's not the same. I still worry, but I think that's the right thing to do. Imagine if I went there from London, having this new type of coronavirus, and um, I would infect him. I, I, I just, I just wouldn't be able to live with the guilt. Well, so I think the that's the my position. yeah, the assumption that you've got it is quite a helpful place to start from. I think when thinking think about whether so. or not you're going to travel. Yes, yes, and you know, just um, finger pointing and everything as the. Um, Welsh ministers that um, this is for uh, for our own um, community, and we all should pull together and get through it. And what did your dad say, Renata, when you told him that you weren't you weren't going to be coming? He was upset, but he said when when I when I talked to him when I explained to him the uh, announcement that Boris Johnson made word for word, and especially the end bit, it just made it just makes sense. It just makes sense. It's for for own for future Christmases to be celebrated with people that you love. Mm. And um, I just I just thought about it, and I just 
I wouldn't be able to go. I just would think it, it wasn't the right thing to do. Um, so well, listen, Renata, I yeah, listen, I completely applaud your self-sacrifice there because to not uh, be able to see your dad in the circumstances that you and he have had over the last 12 months um, and at Christmas time is just appalling. It's just, it, it's it's heartbreaking. Um, but I do think that ultimately, as you say, the guilt that you would feel seeing him when you don't know whether you've got it or not and you're worried about spreading it to him if you were to go to see him, I think that's, I think that is a good reason not to go to be honest even though it is of course incredibly difficult thank you for your call 0345 973 i wonder if what renata has decided to do rings true of your experience as well that perhaps not just for the individual good of the person that you were going to see but for the greater good you've decided not this year i'm afraid come to more of your calls in a few moments time it's tom swarbrick here swarbrick on sunday 12 32 news headlines now tim humphrey the health secretary admits current lockdown measures have failed to contain the new strain of coronavirus. A new heightened tier four has been introduced across London, the South East and parts of Eastern England to cope with rising infections. Matt Hancock told Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC the ease with which the new variant can spread has only recently become apparent. Christmas plans across the whole of the UK have been changed with restrictions now being eased for just one day and no households allowed to mix at all in tier four. The government's called those who rush to leave Tier 4 areas last night before the rules came in, totally irresponsible. The Transport Secretary says extra police are on patrol and people shouldn't go to a railway station unless they have permission to travel. The weather showers a more persistent rain in the west. It will be dry in the east with a high of 10. This is LBC. This is LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick. Live from Westminster. Uh, this is where the radio can be incredibly helpful in times like this in getting information out. Um, Simon rang from Bedford earlier talking about tears and bubbling and whether or not he could cross tears in order to form a support bubble with the person that he can form a support bubble with. Uh, we stuck our Ben Kentish on it, um, who suggested that, yes, indeed, the tears, um, that the support bubbles do continue in all tears and across tears. Uh, so it is an option for people, especially those who are elderly or vulnerable, who otherwise face being alone, that you can, across tears, form bubbles for the Christmas period. So, Simon, I hope that is an option to you. Just all muddling through it together, aren't we? Carol's a new caller in Manchester this afternoon. Hi there, Carol. Hi, Tom. Hi. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, very l loud and clear, Carol. Your thoughts on how we're going to get through this? <laughs> oh, gosh. I, I don't have so many thoughts on how we're getting through this. I just wanted to comment on uh, one of your previous callers in who mentioned the transport police and actually being a bit more assertive in asking people where they were going and why. Yes. And just to say that in the spring... I had the misfortune or fortune of being locked down in Portugal in the Algarve. And we were stopped one day walking along a country lane by the police. They asked us who we were, where we were from, which was England, where we were staying, where we were going and why. And we explained we were going for a walk, we were staying with friends, and, and that's all we were doing. And they said, well, that's fine, take care, be careful. And that was it. And I was very impressed generally with their measures in the Algarve, and they had very few deaths at the time compared to the northwest. In Spain, the police take, I understand, a much more assertive, rigorous, and draconian I'm, approach. I'm and not didn't saying, allow I'm not people many yeah. places. But that's another matter. I didn't Well, I'm not mind. suggesting, Carol, that you would like to see this, because no one likes to see any of this. But do you think it is, no. about, it is now time for that kind of approach to be taken in, in the UK when it comes to the policing of this? Yes, I just think being helpful, as, as, the, as the guy said, the trotter said, being helpful, but also inquiring and reminding people that uh, the rules are there for all of us and uh, to yeah. ensure all our safety, not just the individual, but the community and society. No, quite. So to remind Carol, people good, of that. It's, it's a good point. It's a good point. It's a good contrast to make. Thank you very much indeed for the call. And the point of the lockdown, as we were hearing, or this variant of the lockdown, as we were hearing from Vaughan Gething, the health minister in Wales, is to protect the NHS. I think it, sometimes it gets lost a bit. People talk about, well, you can't stop people from, uh, from dying. People are going to... Yes, unfortunately, people are going to die from this thing, and it is here with us. But the reason why we're locking down is to protect the NHS. And as we heard from Vaughan Gething earlier, the situation in Wales when it comes to intensive care units is really quite dire, to the point where 
where the field hospitals are being set up and there's the possibility that the military could be used. Uh, let's see if we can get a better picture of what is happening in intensive care around the country. Uh, Dr. Ganesh Sunthalingam is a consultant intensi intensivist and outgoing president of the Intensive Care Society. Uh, thank you for being there this afternoon, doctor. Um, give us a sense of, of how... Uh, ICU capacity in this country is coping with the increased number of people attending hospital. Uh, well done with the name. Um, the uh, it, so it's been varying. Uh, I think it's important to put it into context. The current wave has been going on uh, really since the autumn. So we had that enormous spike really early in the year um, uh, because we were you know we were all living differently in January than we are now. So uh, the, the the rate of change was really dramatic. That sort of faded away a little bit over the summer, but actually hospitals were still busy. And this was really touches on your point. You know, during that time we were recovering from that, still having a tr uh, an ongoing flow of COVID cases. There were non-COVID patients to look after, including uh, not only emergencies, but also those with uh, planned surgery who's, you know, had been delayed previously, yep. a lot of diagnostic work, all of those things. So hospitals have actually been busy all the way through. Um, and then starting from sort of September onwards, we've seen really a, a steady increase in intensive care activity. Um, I think starting actually outside London, so um, the northwest, northeast, Midlands were very busy first, uh, as, you, as you've heard, Northern Ireland, Wales uh, have, have carried on increasing. Um, and now, now we're talking about London and the southeast again. So it's been a, a regional pattern. It's come in phases, um, and it does roughly fall into waves. So we're in the we're at the sort of ever increasing second wave at the moment. And in the context of the, uh, the lockdown measures, I mean, I'm not a public health doctor, but actually from the intensive care point of view, a third wave on top of where we already are uh, would be extremely serious. So at the moment, hospitals are coping with COVID. They're coping with non-COVID emergency conditions. People getting ill through the winter, um, and they are doing their best to carry on with planned work as well and, and help us, uh, with, the, help us yeah. with the numbers on this doctor because because um intensive care and hospitals run pretty hot over winter anyway yeah so yeah. you know 80 90 85 percent 90 percent capacity of icu is not unheard of over a sort of standard christmas period of course this is not a standard christmas period um where generally do you think that is? I mean, I'm looking at some hospital trusts, whether it's in the Midlands or Northeast or in the Southeast, where they are at 100% now of ICU beds taken up. Yeah, and um, so the sort of the detailed numbers I'll have to leave to kind of NHS operations sure. to comment on just for accuracy. But but to, to answer your question, actually, a, a lot of a lot of places are over 100 percent. Now, what I mean by that is they've gone into surge capacity, so their their normal sort of funded capacity, as it was say back in January, uh, they've gone well over that, and they're oper they may be operating in areas outside the ICU. They may be um, <clears throat> uh, staff that are stretched, maybe looking at one ICU nurse looking after two patients, uh, with you know with help from other trained staff as well, um, and all of that puts a strain on the system it's not the usual way of working it's very stressful for the staff uh and obviously the, the anxiety is about making sure everyone gets um <clears throat> all the best care and, and um you know it is important to say that people do, will get what they need uh so even if a hospital is full uh there are the measures in place there's networking yeah. and transferring going on between hospitals and so nobody should feel that they you know shouldn't go to hospital um yeah, no, that's a good that's and, a that is a good Sorry, point, and, what, and, a, and, a di and a difference between where we were in March when people were told to sort of uh, not go to the, or, or it was implied that people shouldn't go to the NHS if, they, if it wasn't COVID related, and we saw the backup of cases there. Um, th this yeah, this absolutely. question comes with a lot of uh, comes with a lot of emotional and political baggage, but I, I think I'm going to ask it anyway on the basis that uh, I know a lot of other people will be asking it too. Um, the the percentage of people who catch coronavirus who end up going into hospital is thankfully relatively small. I mean, I realise that's large numbers when you expand it across the country, but it's a relatively small percentage. To what extent do you think that the British people should expect the NHS to cope with this? Uh, and that the idea of having to curtail freedoms over this period of time, especially around Christmas, in order to protect the NHS feels rather difficult. So I think, uh, I mean, you touched on this at the beginning when you introduced me, actually, which is that uh, protecting the NHS really means protecting each other. You know, this is about people uh, who need hip replacements, maybe not be able to get them, you know, if we're still in a, working under stretch conditions, you know, as we go into 2021. You know, all of these things have consequences. So if a hospital intensive care unit is full, um, all the sickest patients come through us <coughs> in all of those categories. But also the, the, the sort of surge working I mentioned, what that actually means is we're also drawing staff and equipment and facilities from other parts of the hospital, including places like operating theatres 
and surgical wards and medical wards. So actually, this mm. is this is about saving everyone that does need the NHS in any shape or form, um, rather than being about the percentage of COVID patients or, or whatever. If, if, the, if the system is overloaded, um, <clears throat> you know, it's a bit like the fire brigade having to go to too many fires. It, it just means that, uh, uh, you know, we need to be able to look after everybody. So I think I think this sort of slightly abstract debate about, you know, percentages of people and uh, the sort of emotion around that is is sort of the wrong question, really. It's, you know, do, do you want the NHS to be able to carry on working uh, or not is a real question. And unfortunately, you know, and I know that the lockdown has, you know, severe consequences for people. I know, you know, we've got loneliness and depression and uh, just social uh, issues and all the rest of it. But so this is, we, we at the uh, hospital end appreciate that that's the case. Sure. Um, but it is important that we keep the... Um, uh, that we keep this sort of code work down. Another point to make on that actually is that. Uh, sorry, after you. Yeah. <coughs> no, no. Sorry. Just, we're we're going to have to come to a close in a moment, uh, Doctor. Yeah, but right. just very, very briefly, in a sentence, if you would, how worried are you that the NHS in England uh, could fall over over the course of the next few weeks, given the transmissibility of this new strain and the fact that people are making their way around the country, regardless of the rules? It would seem. Uh, I don't think we'll fall over. We've uh, already shown we can expand and cope. It'll be at the expense of, uh, importantly, the, the, the staff actually, um, but yeah, and also it'll be at the expense of things that may end up having to give. So some of the some of the less urgent planned surgery, mm. maybe even some of the more, the more urgent planned surgery may have to be delayed. So it'll have impact on the activities. It won't fall over, but uh, the increased activity will come at a price. And uh, really, the final point I want to comment was just that, as Sadiq Khan had said, it, um, it, regardless of the tiers and rules, it's actually up to us as individuals as well. We, we could decide not to do something, and it might mean. Quite somebody else then is free to do something else later in the year so uh, well um, doctor listen um, best of luck to you yeah best of luck to you over this christmas period uh, mind how you go thank you so much for your time this afternoon dr ganesh Sundaralingam, who is a, a consultant intensivist and outgoing president of the intensive care society loads of you want to get on air we've got about 15 minutes in which to get as many of your calls to air as possible we'll do that after this 12 47 Coming up at one on LBC, Majid Noirs. Christmas plans for millions of families are in chaos now after the Prime Minister declared that London and much of the South East will be going into Tier 4. Having slept on it at night, how do you now feel about Christmas being cancelled? Majid Noirs on LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick. Live from Westminster on LBC. Falling like dominoes now, I'm afraid. Breaking news, we heard that the Netherlands and then Belgium had suspended flights and travel uh, into the country from the UK. We've just been told that the Italian Foreign Minister, Luigi Di Maio, says the Italian government is suspending all travel from the UK due to the new strain of COVID-19, Britain being put into some form of self-isolation, it would seem, by uh, countries in our vicinity, and understandably so, I'm afraid, given the new strain of COVID and its possible transmissibility that we have been hearing about. Um, Nigel's in Ashford in Surrey. Hi there, Nigel. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my call. Um, You're welcome, I'm, sir. I'm, I'm unclear of understanding. My brother arrives from the States um, on Tuesday, um, he's going to arrive in the Tier 4 area. His plans are to go through Buckinghamshire, Bedfordshire, and then up to relatives in, in uh, Manchester. So what is the policy in, in people arriving in the UK? Um, it, it, that's my first point. Um, well, if you're, in a tier is, four, if you're in a Tier 4 area, unless, as I understand it, unless you are planning to bubble with somebody, um, you shouldn't be leaving a Tier 4 area to move into other tiers. So what is the policy in terms of people arriving in the UK that have got plans to move on? There's no governance around that. Um, so he arrives in the UK, he then um, uh, visits um, relatives and moves on. There's no governance. What's the guidance given out to the states, etc., for people arriving? Has that been covered? I don't think it has. Um, well, the, uh, it depends if the travel corridor is in place between the United States and the UK, and I don't think it is. So there might have to be some self-isolation that he undertakes once he's arrived in the UK. But it is absolutely clear that travelling between the tiers uh, for any other reason other than bubbling with uh, a, a person that you're able to bubble with is not permitted. So is that clear in the States? That's, that's my that's my point. Is that clear? Oh, I see. So he's... so all right. So before he come before he lands, maybe he yeah. should avail himself of the gov.uk website, which will have the the stats for him. But Nigel, I, I, as you as you point out, you know plans are going to change very very quickly for a lot of people who are continuing to come into the country, uh, even though people can't get out of the country and to other parts of Europe, as we've been seeing. And Nigel, thank you. Dominic's in Colchester. Dominic. Yeah, I, I think this this whole travel police. Well, I think the police at train stations is ridiculous, and I think it's ridiculous for this reason. I I don't go anywhere by 
train except to go into central London. The vast majority of people travel around by car. Even when I lived in London, I lived in Putney, Wimbledon and Purley, everyone I know has a car. The only time they ever get on public transport is to go into central London. So it seems to me this is it will hit a particular demographic and t- particular types of people. But the vast well, it's majority either hitting of people, people making long journeys on the train, isn't it? Or people coming into central London. Yeah, but that's a t- that's a tiny. You know, if if, if 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 you're going off to see a relative, you don't get on the train. You 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 fill Something. your car up with stuff and well. Uh, no, so, I understand. So, I understand that. But yeah. what are we then saying? Are we saying roadblocks on on the roads out of London? I mean, how, uh, how no, no, I'm saying I'm so saying it's a waste of time. I, that, and then there's oh, right. just one other point, which is which is about the whole French police and things stopping you. I, sure. You know, they've been doing that for decades. They, they stopped me 30 years ago. I mean, the culture yeah, not and to the see people... With, with are, respect, but, yeah, but not to check your coronavirus papers in order to, to be able to undertake an essential journey. True, uh, Dominic, I appreciate asked the point. I, they asked me for, me for an ID, they asked me for a passport, yep. and, and French people are used to that. And I, that no, and I understand British that, I understand not. I understand the, the, the cultural differences and the bureaucratic ones when it comes to uh, holding and showing ID. Thank you for the call. Anna's a new caller in Chepstow. Hi there, Anna. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Um, I just want... I was so angry listening to Keir Starmer. I just felt I had to phone. Because he's in a position where he's not having to make the decisions. All he's doing all the time is trying to foment hatred of the government, make cheap political points at their expense. He, he's lucky he doesn't have to, to make the decisions. He, he's been sat on the fence the whole time and just jumping whichever way suits his, his agenda best. Well, I did. So I did angry. make the point, Anna. I did make the point after the press conference has happened that Sir Keir Starmer, and again to the Labour MP, the Shadow Cabinet Minister, that Sir Keir Starmer has actually never said in the last week cancel Christmas. He said the government should review no. it. It needs to hold a Cobra meeting, but he's never actually said I, I, I'm advocate. I'm telling you that the Labour position is that we stop this. So I agree that there is criticism of him and and the way in which he is handling this and perhaps even the way in which politics is is necessarily at the centre of this. But his analysis of how the government has handled this Christmas uh, restriction and, and the bringing in of restrictions, I think is is bang on. And, I, you know, I, I sit here, I know someone that used to work for the government until uh, yeah, March 2018. Like and, and so and I have, I, I can't fault his, his criticism of the way in which the government have handled it. It's been an absolute catastrophe. Yeah, look, I mean, I think Boris was just hoping against hope that he could have kiss, uh, Christmas because I believe he's against curbing people's liberties. I live in Wales. The Welsh government has been curbing our liberties for the last nine months to the nth degree. I've just been to the supermarket today, and once again, they've got half the aisles cordoned off because they're yeah. deciding what is an essential item. Well, listen, I, I realise it is, you know, uh, the point of, for some people, farcical. Um, but um, I, I, having been a, you know, I've, I've done the scepticism stuff, we've looked at it, we've turned the figures over, we've asked the questions about what else could be done, you know about the Great Barrington stuff, all the rest of it. At the moment, there is nothing else. And I think the, the health secretary was alluding to, in my interview with him earlier, um, it's, it's the vaccine versus this form of, of lockdown, I'm afraid, because I'm not sure there's much else. Anna, thank you. James is in Leicester. James. Hi, Tom. Good afternoon. Um, so, on the subject of travelling out of the Tier 4 area, um, that is something at the moment that my husband is currently doing. Um, I mm-hmm. won't share the details too much, but it's to do with a, a fa- an ongoing family illness that recently just turned into a family bereavement. Um, oh, sorry. So, travel... So, thank you. So, you know, travel down on the Friday. Tier 4, to my knowledge, wasn't even known about on the Friday. Um, just had two nights, plans today to come back home. So the alternative is is to either stay there with no clothes, you know, have to make your own arrangements for mail, pay for your own hotel, etc., or travel back and, you know, just minimise any contact on, on route. Yeah, well, listen, James, I think there are, there are, you know, any number of exceptionally difficult circumstances that people find themselves in because of the mm. very quick change of the rules. And, you know, whose definition are we looking at when we talk about essential journeys? To me, not having any clothes and no roof over your head makes your journey home pretty essential. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and I, and I do think when we... The other point is, you know, on if you are going to 
sort of police these um, journeys. Um, mm. I, I think the reason why we're obviously asking that question because we've implemented these levels of tiers, um, which means you know people are going to yeah. unfortunately and it has happened. Try to bend it, has, rules. it has happened very quickly as well, so people uh, didn't get the warning that they might normally get. James, thank you. Have yourself as safe a Christmas as possible. Thank you so much for your calls, texts, tweets and emails over the course of the programme. Uh, Swarbrick on Sunday returns in the new year. I'm back with you Monday night at 10pm. If I don't catch you then, have yourself as good a Christmas as you can possibly have. Have a very happy and safe new year. And we'll see you in 2021 when hopefully we can get on the road on the way out of this. Thank you so much for all your calls, texts, tweets. Uh, Global Player is available to you. Ian Payne is at four. Next on LBC, Majid Nawaz. Thank you, Tom. Coming up, there is much to be sad about this year, but also uh, it's important to keep focus on the positive when we can. So how do you plan to keep calm and carry on during Christmas this year? Before that, the Transport Secretary has said that more British Transport Police uh, have been drafted in after fears uh, the trains will be packed as Londoners uh, tried and are trying a last-ditch attempt to get back home following new Tier 4 restrictions. Where should we draw the line between government and personal responsibility? But first, millions face lockdown down until spring and police have been deployed to railway stations um having slept on it a night how do you now feel about the government cancelling christmas on your radio on global player and play lbc leading britain's conversation this